spacious skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain Good morning, it's 9 o'clock. We will start the April 24th meeting of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. For the record, there's a copy of the Mobile Meetings Act located on the north wall of the chambers. Uh, also, in the rear of the facility, there's an automatic defibrillator in case that is needed. And also note, if you have any cell phones, will you silence them or please turn them off. With that, let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, we will now call to order the Douglas County Board of Equalization meeting. Roll call. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Yes. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Yes. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Item A is approval of the minutes of the Board of Equalization meeting held Tuesday. April 17th, 2018. Item B, call for a meeting and set Tuesday, May 1, 2018 as the date for certified hearing on certified assessment corrections. Mr. Wood. Moved by Commissioner Duda, second by Commissioner Kraft. Please vote. Motion passes, all voting yes. Item C is citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for anyone in the audience to make comment on a Board of Equalization related item that is not officially listed on the agenda. Are there any citizens' comments? Seeing none. We have one item. Item D is a resolution to approve the application for tax exemptions on motor vehicles recommended for approval by the County Treasurer. Move for the approval of resolution D and adjournment. There's a motion by Commissioner Duda, seconded by Commissioner Boyle. Please vote. Motion passes. All voting yes. We'll now call to order the Douglas County Board of Commissioners meeting. Roll call. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. All present. Item 1, Minutes and Claims. Letter A, approval of the minutes of the Board of Commissioners meeting held Tuesday, April 17, 2018. Item B, approval of claims submitted for payment processed through Tuesday, April 24, 2018. It's the will of the Board. Second. Motion by Commissioner Kraft, second by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. Motion passes. All voting yes. Item two is the consent agenda. There are 11 items on the consent agenda. What's the will? Well, I need to ask if we can pull uh, E number two. There's an amendment that needs to be made to that. Um, with that, the will of the board. I'd like to pull G separately. Okay, G will be pulled. Mark. Uh, Claire, do you need Claire. to pull? Yes, okay. yeah. Thank you. I will be abstaining from item four. Okay. With that, yes. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent so, agenda so with the removal of E2, letter G, and letter K? There's a motion by Commissioner Ball. Second. Second by Commissioner Duda. Please vote. I vote yes. Motion passes. All voting yes. And, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just for E2, I'm uh, handing out some okay. copies of the. Uh, Please do. Um, consent agenda item E2 is the resolution to approve an affiliation agreement between Douglas County Health Center and Creighton University for Dental Services. The clerk is handing out uh, the new contract. This was talked about at the Board of uh, Health meeting, the Health Center meeting, Board of Trustees meeting, and there has been a tweak added. Jane, if you want to come up and explain this. Good morning, Commissioners. 
Jean Hartnett, Administrator with the Douglas County Health Center. Um, as Commissioner Rogers mentioned, there has been a slight modification to the affiliation agreement with Creighton Dental. Uh, the modification relates to on your second page, item 10A related to professional liability insurance. Our initial contract um, had boilerplate language related to liability insurance that required Creighton to qualify under the Nebraska Liability Fund. We've since learned that dentists do not um, fall under the Nebraska Liability Fund. So Creighton Dental has offered alternative language, which you will note in item 10A. What this does is it still allows us to have liability coverage for students when they are practicing um, in their clinical experience on our campus. So that it's just a slight modification, but still offering coverage. We don't have a board, so you all are going to have to okay, oh. commission the board. Yes, I have a, uh, a question about, um, really about procedure. Have, I'm curious, contracts like this, where do they end up? Where are they filed? If you want to look at them again, do they go to the county attorney or do they go to you or who? Patrick? Typically, I send it to the, the county clerk's office. County clerk. So the county clerk, you keep all the contracts? Correct. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Prior to that, it may be, pardon me for interrupting, the county attorney's office has vetted this but prior to it coming to Board of Trustees and Board of Commissioners, so that loop has also been covered. Uh, something like approved form, which, anyway, <laughs> I always have a problem with. That's okay. Commissioner Borgeson. Motion to approve. Wait a minute, you have one question. And did, did I understand you that the professional liability would be provided by Creighton, not by us? It is my understanding that it would be offered by Creighton, yes. Okay, because that, it doesn't, oh, providing at services at, well, it doesn't really say that. Um, the rest of them say like universities shall maintain, universities shall be responsible. It might be worth adding that, I don't know, I'll let the legal beagles figure that out, but I just wanted to make sure that it was them sure. that was providing. Yes, it, it, in the email that I received from their risk manager, it is indicated that Creighton would provide that, but you're, you're correct, Commissioner Borgeson is not reflected in the contract as such. Tracy, York County Attorney's Office. If I may direct the board's attention to the beginning of paragraph 10, it says, during the term of this agreement, university shall maintain at its own expense the following professional liability insurance, and then goes into 10A, and 10A provides for the one million per occurrence and three million in the annual aggregate. So I think Perfect. that the language that you're looking for is there, but it is, is actually comprised in two different paragraphs. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? There are motion to approve. Uh, motion by Commissioner Kraft, second by Commissioner Duda. Please vote. Motion passes, all voting yes. I'm going to go to item K, approval of the special designation liquor license for Ponca Hills Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, motion by Commissioner Boyle. S seconded by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. Uh, one, one moment, please. <laughs> okay, good go. For the personal purpose, yes. uh, I believe I'm supposed to say why I'm staying as a member of the Punk Hills Volunteer Please. Fire Department. I, uh, I'll probably be having a beer, but I'll uh, not be voting on it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank motion, you. Motion passes. Uh, as Commissioner Duda stated, he's abstaining. Everyone else voting yes. And you're supposed to use this as a method of promoting the event. Okay. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Item G. Resolution approving best and final offer to the Fraternal Order Police Lodge 8 in pursuit of a one-year collective bargaining agreement for the period of July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2018. What's the will of the board? It's a motion by Commissioner Duda. Second? No. No, he can, he can go in discussion. Second by Commissioner Borgeson. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, yes, I'm going to be brief on this. I sent you uh, an email describing what uh, what I intended to do this morning. And what I'm asking about, uh, asking us to, to do is to amend the contract, as it is the labor contract before us, to uh, include alternative resolution uh, rather than sending everybody to court. Um, we don't know uh, yet what the cost is of 
of uh, having all of these, uh, I think there's six pending right now, uh, in the court system uh, with uh, judges deciding whether or not a prom promotion should be made uh, on, a, on a, an employee. It is, uh, in my opinion, it's something we really need to get the facts on. And, uh, uh, but I think, I, I feel comfortable enough, I've worked, worked with the state troopers and did arbitration and um, uh, I'm comfortable with it. I know how it works, and um, uh, it's a good system. The other thing I have experience with unions stepping up and policing their own employees. The city of Omaha, uh, uh, we talked to the civilian union there, Ed Cox, rest his soul. Uh, we talked about the uh, violations of, of sick leave. There was a lot of sick leave going on. And so uh, Mr. Cox agreed that the union would step in and uh, make sure that employees were really uh, using that benefit appropriately. Uh, and it worked very well. It brought a, a really good resolution. That's what this union would do as well. Uh, an employee who feels uh, grieved uh, cannot just file a grievance with civil service. It would go uh, through the union, and the union would either approve it or decline it. And that is it. They're the gatekeeper, which is really an important uh, point to bring this out. I think it's really a, a good thing to do, and it, it, it really enhances the attractiveness. Uh, in 2002, the county approved uh, this sort of procedure for the Sheriff's Merit Commission. So we have uh, it in operation already for one of the other Fraternal Order of Police unions. Uh, it is not a, a, a waste of money. It is actually, I think, going to save money. I think it will add to morale uh, when employees have a disagreement over something that uh, is about where they park their car, uh, where they, uh, where, if they're not they're promoted. Uh, this should not be clogging up the court system, tying up county attorneys. Uh, we shouldn't be doing that. So what I'd like to do is offer uh, an amendment to the uh, uh, labor contract, uh, and I'll pass this out, but uh, not, not now, but I, uh, I will get it all to you. It's very clear. Um, I'd like to see Douglas County and FOP Lodge 8 enter into a separate memorandum of agreement wherein each agrees that they will endeavor to propose and advance a legislative bill in the Nebraska legislative session to begin in January of 2019 with the intent to amend Nebraska revised statute 23-2510 to allow a certified or recognized bargaining agent of employees in the Douglas County Department of Corrections to bring non-disciplinary appeals to the Douglas County Civil Service Commission. And we used to do this. So that's what I'm proposing, and I uh, make that motion. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Commissioner Kavanaugh. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Yes. Um, I, I uh, generally agree with the Commissioner Boyle. I just had a, a couple of questions. The amendment um, that uh, you've shared with me uh, reads that uh, we will uh, work with FOP 8 uh, with the Nebraska legislature in January 2019, the next time they meet. Right. Uh, to uh, get a change in statutes to allow a certified or recognized bargaining agent of employees in the Douglas County Department of Corrections to bring non-disciplinary appeals to the Douglas County Civil Service Commission. Um, is that arbitration? Is that what we're talking about here? Uh, I believe it is. It is to me. It's a, uh, an arbitration provision uh, dealing with non-disciplinary grievances. Okay. And I notice that we have uh, representatives of the brave men and women from the Douglas County Corrections Officers, uh, FOP 8, with us today. And their representative, Mr. Corgan, could you uh, come up for a second? John Corgan, uh, 1411 Harney Street, Omaha, Nebraska, on behalf of Eternal Order, please last me rate. Thanks for being here. Um, this amendment, I presume you've, you've uh, gone over this amendment as well? The, um, we have. And um, is this, uh, you know, as far as a move towards arbitration in these matters uh, acceptable to uh, uh, bargaining unit FOP 8? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> I guess from my perspective, the, we have in the contract with the county and have had since at least 1979 a provision that says that Grievances go to the Civil Service Commission, and it doesn't distinguish between whether that's a disciplinary grievance or not a disciplinary grievance. It's always been, at least since I've been around, in this contract. In 2007, the Commission of uh, the Civil Service Commission uh, had 
I think, 48 cases backed up because there was no provision that prevented anybody from filing an individual grievance. And they eventually went to court, and the district court decided that the statute 25, I'm sorry, 232510 did not allow the commission to exercise jurisdiction over anything other than disciplinary grievances. And that's been the case really since 2007. What we're talking about doing is going, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. Obviously, if it's going to happen, it's going to take a cooperative effort with the legislature. Obviously, a governor has to sign that, or you all are very experienced in the difficulties in passing legislation. But there is no cost to the state for this. We think that will certainly help. It's not traditionally arbitration in the sense that the Civil Service Commission, what this amendment is suggesting is if the director decides after the grievance procedure, which is the director is kind of the third step, if the director makes a decision and the employee isn't happy about that, the union itself can take that grievance to the Civil Service Commission, and the Civil Service Commission then would decide based on a vote of the majority whether the contract had been violated by the alleged conduct of the employer, or the employee for that matter. I mean, it goes both ways. But the factor of the union having to be in charge of that, so let's say that the individual employee wants to take a grievance because they felt they should have been awarded the parking spot that they didn't get, and the union said, no, you're wrong, you didn't get that and you should not have gotten that. That employee can't do anything about that. I mean, they may try to do something internally or externally with the union, but it doesn't involve the county. And the reason this is important is the current process is time-consuming. There is no end date necessarily on when a claim has to be denied by the board, and then we're into the court system. And we have this in the contract today. We've had it for a long time. The union, we have been working at this for many, many years, and my own estimate is that had this provision been in place for the last three years, the Civil Service Commission may have seen about 2.3 grievances more a year than they did under the current status. I know my work with the FOP Lodge 2, we might have one or two grievances a year, if that, in front of the Merit Commission. So it's not a workload process, but it is a simple alternative dispute resolution mechanism, and what we're asking you to do is assist us in the legislature to make this change because it is a streamlining of dispute resolution that really helps both sides. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I really, you know, we're not too far apart on this contract, and we understand the concept of last, best, and final offer, and we'll have to take that to a vote, and all we're asking is you to go down Lincoln with us hand-in-hand next year and see that this change takes place so that we have a place to land that doesn't involve a direct shot to the district court. So thank you. I appreciate that. And Commissioner Boyle, thanks for bringing this. I think this is a real step in the right direction, and I think it could save us some money, too, if we go that route rather than litigating things. So thanks for bringing it. Not in my personal interest, I'd just like to say. I understand that. But I commend you for bringing this, and I'm enthusiastic in my support of your motion. Commissioner Boyle. Well, the other thing I'd add is that, and thank you for your presentation. It was right on point. You know, I think if we would add this, you know, this is so similar to what we do at the Sheriff's Merit Commission. It is similar to the City of Omaha Personnel Department or the Personnel Board. All these things are, all those boards and commissions and the Merit Commission, all the rest, are geared to end disagreements that occur between employees and the employer, and it is, you know, it is governed by the unions. They control what comes and goes. It's a rare, it's a good opportunity to really streamline things and get this out of the court system. Judges should not be asked to decide who gets to park in a parking place. It's a waste of resources. I think it's a good thing. So I hope that you'll consider doing this. I think it's a good thing, and 
uh, with that, I'll uh, uh, you know uh, close out. I, I think if we do vote for this, one of the first things we should do is ask Mike Dornicky, our auditor, to look at what the cost is and bring back a, a real explanation of what we're paying now and what we might pay under this system. So thank you very much for considering this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Cavanaugh and Commissioner Duda. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to the uh, members of FOP, the uh, aid who have taken time out of their own day to come down here today and participate in this discussion. Thank you. Commissioner Duda. Well, this whole thing makes me very uncomfortable since public negotiating is illegal. Um, and it sure seems like we're getting every opportunity we can to try to do that. A question on this amendment, which, by the way, I haven't seen yet. Before we vote on it, I hope I get to see it. Um, we are now committing a future board, next year's board, to say you will lobby for this issue. Is that part of the amendment that I haven't seen yet? Uh, yes. Okay. How can we commit a future board? We don't even know if the seven of us are still going to be here next year. Some of us are up for re-election. What if it's a different board and they say, we don't support this legislation, and we say, too bad, it's in the union contract that we have to support this legislation. What if a commissioner disagrees and goes down to Lincoln and lobbies against it? Not that any of us would ever lobby against the will of the board. Is that illegal? How can we take a stand, the public negotiation is a bad idea. I don't like this whole conversation. I don't like committing a future board. I think all of these things are illegal and inappropriate. We put our final and best offer on the table, but I knew that we would have a chance to really show the unions how strong some of us are for them and never, never pass up an opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Well, I just to briefly comment, um, I understand your concern, and, I, and I, it doesn't surprise me we've had these conversations privately, and, and I understand it, and I respect your position. Um, I apologize for not passing out this amendment in advance. I, I was at an 8 o'clock meeting, which uh, didn't materialize right away. But anyway, um, the, uh, uh, you know, we commit, our, we commit future boards to things all the time. We're about ready to do that on a, a project coming up. And, um, but uh, this is nothing bizarre. It, this is what we're at. What this asks for is the standard we have with other departments and even other unions. Well, the Sheriff's Merit Commission, we have a, you know, the grievances are handled there and uh, it is one that avoids, if at all possible, uh, filing suits. So I think it has a lot of merit and I just, I think we ought to consider it and let the unions be the gatekeeper. So. Commissioner Kraft. Yes. Um, this has been brought up in the lengthy discussions we've had regarding the negotiations, and while I'm in favor of it, and in favor of arbitration, we've been negotiating this for over 10 months, I believe. When does the contract come due again? When does this expire? I'm sorry. Commissioner Mark C. Martin, th this contract expired on June 30th of 2017. June 30th. We've been negotiating since uh, we, we exchanged in May uh, proposals in L17, and we've been negotiating uh, thus far. So, yeah, it was part of the negotiation package. There's only two more months before we start negotiating again. I'm in favor of this, but I'm going to suggest we just delay this until the new negotiations start. I'm in favor of arbitration, too, so. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Boyle. I'd like to call the question, if no one else is up to speak. There is no other questions. There's a motion on the floor. The clerk has the motion. Clear. Well, repeat we, what you have, please. We have, uh, well, <laughs> I would request that we can get the exact wording of what <laughs> Commissioner Boyle. Uh, I'm sorry. But we have, what, Fast we, action. what we have is uh, a consent agenda item G amend uh, amend to enter in a separate MOU and obviously there, he had much more than that but I thought that was the uh, the gist of what uh, he's offering and I have a motion by Commissioner Boyle and a second by Commissioner Cavanaugh. Can we got another question Commissioner Boyle? Um, not so much a question but since the union uh, folks are here today I wanted to explain my vote um, which I've already um, stated prior to this public but uh, setting, but um, a few weeks ago, a month ago, I, I don't even know how long ago now, this chamber was filled with representatives from the correction facility um, with very um, 
heartbreaking conversations of in in hopes that we would address the overtime issue at the correction facility which hit each and every one of us um, right in the heart and we got busy um, and started to come up with what we could do to figure that uh, problem out and part of this contract um, answers uh, those issues uh, while we're still working on some of the HR processes. So um, I agree with arbitration as well, but this is not the proper forum nor procedure for us to bring this in to the contract at this point. If the overtime issue, and again, as far as I know, the overtime issue is still a problem. Um, I see some heads nodding yes. Then I would think that we need to uh, hurry up and approve this contract that allows us to offer an increase in pay to draw on individuals coming to work for uh, the county and the correction facility and then move after that into negotiating the next contract as we all know is going to happen within a um, very short short time period. Commissioner Duda. Can I see a copy of the amendment that we're about to vote on? It's on the way. It's on the way? Will we get it before we vote on it? Yes, sir. Oh. Four minutes. Well, okay. Or we'll talk about something else. I don't care. <laughs> Sorry. That'll get kind of complicated. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, like it's, yeah. I apologize. It's not really an option because the motion's on the floor and it's live. So seeing no further questions, there is a motion uh, to... And, and I'm going to sum this up roughly, a motion to include uh, an agreement to uh, advocate for legislation for arbitration to the state legislature and to the current contract. That's fair? I think so. And I, I, in all candor, uh, I didn't think it was necessary to distribute the uh, language because I think I know how everybody's going to vote. Okay. <laughs> With that, we, uh, Commissioner Morgan. Just say one thing. Uh, I, too, am supportive of at least looking at the arbitration issue but at the same time i didn't feel this is the appropriate place to be discussing that and i think what commissioner Kraft said and borgeson about we're going to be negotiating in the next six weeks two months and listening to marcos and diane carlson we need to do it in that right fashion so that's my position and I do want to be uh, supportive of what's going on uh, in the future and discussing it fully. Okay. Again, there's a motion to amend, uh, to add um, language. We nod on that motion. Uh, please vote. Motion fails. Commissioners Boyle and Kavanaugh voting yes. All their commissioners voting no. Item G, resolution is we have a motion to second. Please vote. Uh, give us one moment, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, yes. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Motion passes. Commissioner Kavanaugh abstains. All other commissioners voting yes. Well, you know, I think that uh, we should have adopted the Commissioner Boyle's uh, <laughs> amendment. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the point of these negotiations is to reach agreement. And uh, we've heard that this would help us reach agreement. And now we've taken a step to not reach agreement. This is a non-economic demand, and I think that we should have probably included it. I understand and I share uh, Commissioner Duda's um, concern about seeing stuff at the last minute. Um, I think that we should have more robust and public discussion of important county business. And so, you know, for those reasons, although much of the contract I think is warranted and, and probably good 
I, I don't know why we stumble over non-economic demands that, as Commissioner Boyle points out, is probably going to save us money, probably going to be good for the taxpayers of Douglas County. And so thank you, Commissioner Boyle, and, and but for that, I guess I would have voted for it. I, there's other requests to speak, but since the motion's been voted on, I'm going to move. Um, <laughs> with that, is there any citizen, we go to item number four, are there any citizen's comments at this time? This is an opportunity to comment on an item that is not officially listed on the board's agenda. I'm, my name is John Corrigan, 1411 Harney Street. Uh, it, just a comment, we just saw five members of this board say they're in favor of arbitration, and we know we're going to go back to con uh, negotiations for a, a, a uh, contract year. That is, that is to say we will go back to negotiations if the membership of Lodge 8 adopts or ratifies the, the the offer that has been made. But if there's five people on this board, uh, to, to your point, Mr. Duda, uh, ter, uh, us discussing this contract in this open meeting, I was told I would have that opportunity to do that, so that's why I'm here. And it's not illegal. It is not illegal for us to have these conversations. One. And two, the board, just about your concern about members of the board uh, binding future boards. Most of the time, these are multi-year contracts. That happens all the time as to uh, the, the, the statement of what's going to be the wages in terms of conditions of employment or agreements with the union or with Hawkins Construction or whoever that is. The, the, the county obligates itself for years uh, into the future on a, a regular basis. So this isn't anything different. But now that we have the statements from five of the board members that they're in favor of some alternative dispute resolution, uh, I look forward to... Uh, uh, keeping those, our, our offers in that regard that have been on the table for 10 years will continue to be discussed, and I thank you for your time. Any other citizen comment? Seeing none, we're going, okay, citizen comment? My name is Juliet Summers, 216 South 86th Street, 68114. I'm actually here to testify in support of a budget request. I'm not certain if this is the correct time for me to speak. Um, I'll give you time in the budget discussions coming up. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Right. Uh, and I'm assuming I know, so you'll get your opportunity on that. For the sake of time, we're going to move the budget discussion up and the finance committee up. Commissioner Cry. Uh, will you have the gentleman for the presentation? He's on Elected officials here. We need to get out of here. Yeah, yeah I'm going to try to. So we're going to move it up to try to get the uh, electors back to work in court. Um, item A, finance. Item 1 is the budget report, assuming it is as read. We'll go to items 2 and 3 together. Don and uh, Tom ask you all to present one present, then the other present, because my assumption is there will be some questions that may come jointly. So with that, um, we'll go into the budget presentation for the public defender. Tom Roth. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Tom Riley, Douglas County Public Defender, HO5 Civic Center. Um, my budget request uh, exceeds the suggested uh, number by the county commissioners or by, by the county administration. And uh, I, I can pretty much make it pretty simple as to why. Um, I included in... Uh, some handouts this morning, the uh, caseload numbers. And if you look from 2014 to 2017, you'll see an increase in felonies by 1,000, an increase in... Uh, Tom, let me ask you a question. I'm assuming, are you referring to the information you provided uh, for the did, budget to the board? Did we give these to everybody? Budget information permitted in the middle. It's it's right after the budget figure. Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Well, we need copies. You need the time? I think Reserve. so. I'm okay. I've got mine on my laptop, <laughs> which you all should be using. He's got his on his laptop too. Get with the computerization, will you? <laughs> 
Okay. We have one, PJ and on down the line. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Uh, you guys have mine, so I'm going to do it by memory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe. Uh, screen, too, maybe. We tried earlier, and it looked pretty. Obviously, the misdemeanor and felony caseload has exploded, um, and as you can see, in 2014 and 2015, the increases were minimal. Then in 2016, there was a big spike, and um, I was hoping that it was just an odd year, so I didn't uh, come asking for additional help. Uh, but as you can see, and we go calendar year, not um, not fiscal year. So this is January to December 31st. And you can see the uh, in the, the two primary categories of concern are felonies and misdemeanors, and they've gone way up. Uh, juvenile delinquency cases have gone up uh, a couple of hundred, and the others have have remained static or decreased a, a bit. Now those are the you know, th those are not numbers that are have a big impact on us. Um, the corrections department, um, with whom I have a great relationship, uh, thanks to Dr. Foxhall, sends me a, uh, a jail census every day. And I pulled uh, the one from Sunday, and it shows that of the uh, inmate population of about, I think I want to say 1,300, um, 965 are pretrial detainees. Um, only 144 people are doing county jail time out of the 1,300, 1,200 uh, people that are in being held in jail. Obviously, there's Couple of there's a hundred or so for the U.S. Marshal, a couple for ICE, um, and a smattering of other detainees. But the the big number is there are 965 people sitting there waiting to get to court, um, and we have currently 52 lawyers. And I can tell you that the main reason that the budget uh, request that I'm making exceeds what you um, recommended is because I'm asking for two more lawyers. And that run, rounds out to about 120, a little a little less than that. Um, and I really need them. Um, I can't, we can't absorb 800 additional felonies and, um, you know, close to 2,000 additional misdemeanors over a two-year period with the status quo. Uh, I, I just can't do it. Um, I have never, ever in my career um, asked a judge to stop appointing us because we have too many cases. They do it all over the country. Every time I go to a webinar or whatever, um, you know, they always say best practices. You have to have a cap on your caseload. I just don't want to do that. Uh, because I don't want to um, have the cost of court-appointed counsel when you have a public defender's office, and they are appointing people outside of our office. There's an additional cost to that. Um, but but I can't. I don't see any resolution to this. I can tell you that um, the numbers this year are fairly close to what last year's. I don't see a, another huge increase. But it looks like it's about the same um, as last year's numbers when you average them out. Um, as a result, um, I, I need the help. Uh, I need two more lawyers. I, I can tell you that, obviously, representing clients and the numbers that we have, a lot of our lawyers 
their psyche <laughs> kind of ebbs and flows from feeling okay to feeling overwhelmed, to feeling pressured, feeling depressed. And typically the way I handled that is I would uh, bring someone in that I noticed was having tr struggles and I'd bring them in and say, okay, what do we need to do? Can we lighten your load? Are, are, we, are you having a problem? And historically we've been able to handle it that way. Um, I can say over the last eight months, I have never seen uh, the, uh, the almost the entire staff feeling overwhelmed. Uh, I watched Commissioner Worthington made reference to the uh, uh, day that the corrections officers were here, and I was I happened to be watching that, and uh, I maybe that opened my eyes a little bit to what I was seeing right around me myself with people. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a workaholic, so I come in all the time, um, Saturdays and Sundays, and I can tell you over the last six months, I ain't alone, <laughs> and we don't get OT. Um, I always tell the lawyer in our office, uh, this job takes as long as it takes. Uh, if that means you have to come in on Saturday and Sunday, that means if you have to stay late, that's what you have to do. Um, and they do it. They do it. Um, but I think... Um, I'm at the point where I have to ask you to give us uh, some help in the form of uh, two additional lawyers. I'm, I'm not even sure that that will suffice, but I, that's where I want to start. Um, uh, like I said, ab absorbing this amount of, of cases is, is uh, just overwhelming. And keep in mind, keep in mind, we also do our own appeals too. Uh, you know, the Attorney General handles the appeals uh, for prosecutions. We do our own appeals. Uh, as well. So we, we get the case from stem to stern. Um, and brief writing is a very time consuming uh, and difficult process. And uh, I always tell my lawyers, well, then don't lose and you won't have to appeal. But I don't have control over that. <laughs> Having written an awful lot of briefs myself lately, I guess I have nowhere to talk when it comes to that losing, I guess. But um, the, the other thing that is a kind of a problem that I've got some increases on, on the non-salary area. And by the way, I asked for a 3% uh, increase to go into effect in January. So the numbers in, it would, that I submitted is a 3% uh, raise that would go into effect uh, in January. So it's a six month number. I'm asking to be allowed to hire the two new lawyers in, in July, beginning of this fiscal year in, in July. Um, and uh, the, I was going to say the other the other driver of increased cost is trying a case now and trying a case 25 years ago, and I'm, I'm sure Don can answer it the same way, is, is apples and oranges. The technology that's involved now, um, I, ha I don't have a case where I just read police reports. Uh, the, the witnesses are all interviewed on disk, and you could read a police report of a five-hour interview in half an hour. But if you're, if you're watching the interview, and you better be, damn well be watching the interview in its entirety, we're talking three, four, five hours. Prosecutors have to do it. We have to do it. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of time consumption in there. The other thing is now they have technology that can place cell phones at certain areas, and there's experts that have to come in and testify about this. There have been huge, dramatic changes in how they're analyzing DNA now, uh, which is of very recent origin uh, that requires the, both the state and us to hire consultants, experts. Um, sometimes they have to come in and testify. Sometimes I use them as a consultant to say, okay, how do I cross-examine this, this expert that, that they're going to be using? Um, there, you know, the technology is overwhelming, and, and when you get phone records and oh God, Facebook, and all all of those kind of things, you have to sit there and look through them. And the fo the phone records, you can imagine, uh, most of our clients are, you know, in and in, in felonies are probably between the ages of 16 and 25. And if any of you know anyone that's in those age groups, they are addicted to those phones, and they're on them constantly. Well, they can track them now, whether, whether you're in using it or not. If your phone's on and you're getting 
you know, notices, and they call it uh, data. Uh, ESPN sends you something. Um, you think no big deal. Well, that's that's on your phone, and they can put you where within a very close range now. Um, and you know whether that science is as accurate as they claim, we have to we have to challenge that. Um, and I said on the DNA. We've been using, or the state typically has been using the Med Center for um, DNA analysis. And uh, in a recent case I had, they, uh, they hired a, a guy that had more degrees than a thermometer um, to, uh, uh, who had created his own method of analyzing DNA, uh, which is very complex. And it takes out the human factor, and it basically it's a computer program that says um, they could uh, uh, analyze DNA and how important it was to the state's case. When the human analysis uh, was done, the result was uh, that my client was a one in 3,000 comparison. And when they did it with this other computer program, it was like one in a bazillion. Um, so th those kind of things are, are very, very um, powerful tools. As you can imagine, scientific evidence has a great impact on juries, and it's necessary for us to um, to raise whatever issues uh, that are possible. I, you know, the number, the, it, that's our professional fees, well, I was 125, I'm asking 135, that includes psychiatrists, and any, I'm sure Don can tell you, Dr. Fox will probably tell you on a regular basis, that uh, a very high percentage of people in the jail have mental health issues. Um, and uh, when we when we are faced with that, we have to have the client evaluated to determine whether they're competent to proceed to trial, um, and whether they fit the uh, insanity defense. Um, and sometimes you just need to do it for purposes of sentencing to show that this person may not be as culpable because of mental mental health issues. So there's there's and all those things are very very expensive. Um, so. That's pretty much uh, where where I'm at and where why I'm asking for the uh, money over I'm sorry money over what is recommended. Um, I do it reluctantly, but but um, I feel like my back's against the wall on this stuff, and I don't I just don't want to be in a position where I'm going up to a judge and saying, "Hey, judge, you're gonna have to start appointing private lawyers because we we can't handle the numbers anymore. If you give me two more lawyers." I, I think we can make it through the year, and we'll have to reassess it again at the end of the next year. That, that's that's where I'm at. We have questions from Commissioner Kraft, Borgeson, and Boyle. And the cost, if we have to go to the judge and ask him uh, or tell him you do not have enough attorneys, the county still pays for it, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, over... over I will do anything not to do that. I mean, I, if you don't give me the lawyers, I'll just do my best, probably. Um, unless I see, see people starting to wobble on the interstate bridge. I mean, and it is less expensive for us to use our own attorneys. Well, I think in the long haul it is. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, you know, obviously that. Uh, we have a pretty good relationship, not, not pretty good, we have a very good relationship with the county attorney's office. We get discovery, um, we, we, we work, can work things out. Um, you know, and private lawyers who maybe have 10 cases a year with, uh, with prosecutors, it's gonna take longer for them to get up to speed, uh, do research, stuff that we have done 25, 30 times, and we have in our you know, motion bank and in our brief bank, um, we can get that stuff done quicker. And I'm not slamming any private attorneys, don't, don't get me wrong. There uh, are a bunch of really good private lawyers that do criminal criminal work here. I'm just saying, as, far, as a matter of fiscal responsibility, the public defender's offices across the country are, are the wiser decision uh, as far as fiscal uh, concerns go. Thank you. Commissioner Borgs. Thank you, Tom. Um, a couple of questions. So. Sure. The 52 public defenders you have right now, you would add two to that. Yes. But you also have other staff that 
make then makes up to the 120, right? Yes. Okay, I just wanted yes. to make sure it wasn't 120 attorneys that I was missing. No, no, okay. there, it, that includes uh, for the support staff, um, which uh, I'm not asking for an increase uh, right. necessarily in that at this point. Okay, and then um, what is, I know you've given this to us before, but the client attorney ratio right now it was pretty high last year if i remember when we looked at it um we talk about that a lot but i don't remember the numbers well it, it basically it you know the what we do is we have supervisory staff who dole out the cases every day and we have target numbers and we have a group of lawyers that do more misdemeanors than felonies. Okay. Uh, so we'll have a group of maybe 10 or 12 that get 50 misdemeanors a month. I mean, the, the, the caseload that they carry is probably 200 at a time on average as far as the ones that do a lot of misdemeanors. The ones that do a lot of felonies, they do misdemeanors as well. I'm not going, I don't want to be in a position where if a guy gets charged with a felony uh, and then he's out on bond and he gets charged with petty larceny or shoplifting or something. I don't want two lawyers. I want one lawyer handling it. I, I don't like the idea of our clients not knowing who the heck their lawyer is. You know, you show up on day one and lawyer X is there and, you know, the next hearing there's someone else. That, that doesn't fly. So uh, the, the, the numbers vary based on the responsibility that the lawyer has. I have the, the, the lawyers that do the homicide cases. Um, you know they're not going to be doing as many misdemeanors. Uh, we call we call them overflow. So when when the numbers hit, we have a group that gets 50 misdemeanors a month, a group that gets 40 misdemeanors a month, a group gets 35. And then we have the overflow, which is the more experienced folks that we're hoping we don't have to have do misdemeanors, but sometimes we just have to because they they can't handle everything, and that's what where the problem is is that you know they're having to be in lots of different courtrooms at the, on the same day and it gets frenetic um and I, that's probably the best answer i could give you uh, okay. as to um the loads so the um and you can break out like how many of these are or of those when i'm reading your chart the 1,300 are the juvenile cases, or are there juvenile cases mixed in all of these numbers? No. The juvenile, you see where it says J delink status? Uh-huh. That's um, delinquency cases, the way we define them, and that includes um, if, you, if a, a kid gets charged with what would be a crime if it was an adult. Say a kid does a uh, auto theft, and he's 14 or 15, they'll file it in a juvenile court. That's a delinquency case. And status is truancies and, th and things along those lines. Um, then next to that is called parent cases. And those are, um, we call those three A's and they're neglect dependency cases and it's where an individual um, is in danger of losing their uh, parental rights. So we re represent the parent. And the reason we are doing that is because many, many times the parent is also charged with some kind of an assault or a sexual assault on the kid, which generated the, the filing on the, uh, to take away parental rights. So if we're, we're representing them both in juvenile court and in the parent case, we call it, and we also represent them on the felony charge, it's usually a felony charge in, in uh, adult court. But you're representing the parent in that case. That's right. right. Okay. The gu guardian ad litem would be um, representing the kids in, in those situations if there's not a delinquency case uh, with it. Um, and we, when we first started doing this, you may remember, we were representing the kids as GALs and we were having to conflict out of so many cases because we were representing the parent on a, on a, a offense that, would, that generated the parent case. We said, gee, we're, you know, um, we're going to end up representing the kid as a GAL, but we're we're getting out of these felonies, which is our statutory obligation. So that's when we did the yeah, switch. I remember that. Um, and and uh, suggested that we, we wouldn't get out of it. We'll just represent the parents instead. And I think that that has worked to the benefit of all involved. Okay. Um, the uh, BMH is Board of Mental Health Commitments. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, you know those have remained fairly static, as you can see. And fraternity cases are, and child support cases, I, we kind of lump those, and those are those are uh, case, those are those are jobs that are you know starter jobs that we we give uh, the newer lawyers mm -hmm. cases on that. What I try to do is give even the newer lawyers. I want to give them some exposure to felonies, uh, of course, with assistance. Um, uh, because I found that if we had people that were ju just doing the uh, child support and paternity cases, they were going crazy. And so we split it up, split it up with a bunch of people, and so they get to do misdemeanors and felonies as well as the the uh, non-support cases. But the paternity is mostly adult, not all all, all adult. All adult. All adult. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. I think we talked about this even last time. It just it um, strikes me as very interesting that we can talk about crime going down in the city, and it's touted quite a bit. And then all of a sudden, we have the public oh uh oh <laughs> public defender coming, and I know the county attorney will be too. Um, that shows these numbers of felonies going up. Um, well, all of them that we talked about going up. So anyway, I'm just. That just drives me crazy on how that is touted all yeah. the time, yep. and yet our numbers and those we can look at our juvenile detention center and we can look at our adult corrections facility, and those numbers don't drive with what's being said. So, um, no, they don't. Yeah. Um, I've I've seen I've seen some of those numbers, and if you read the fine print, a lot of times it'll say, "Well, this isn't counting drug cases or firearms charges." Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, those are, those are those are significant <laughs> amount of the cases that we right. get. You know, I, I thought I thought one honestly. In some meeting I went to, and I I saw how the crime rate was going down, and I thought, what what what, what am I missing here? And then right. I, I saw in the fine print, not not this excludes firearm What's charges included, and, and yeah. drug cases. Well, okay, that explains <laughs> it a little better. Right. Well, to me, this is the truer picture of what we're dealing with in the county in terms of um, crime. And again, we can see that our costs continue to go up. My last question is um, another issue that's near and dear to your and my hearts is this public advocacy office. Mm -hmm. We're still at last year, I think it was 438,000 or 400 and something thousand, or a couple years ago when we tried to get that money or at least half of it back. Um, I still think that is a legislative initiative that we should put back on the table. Um, again, w we here need those dollars to provide to our cases that we're seeing, not for it to go to Lincoln into some super fund um, for at that time it was Lancaster who was um, using that office the majority of the time. So I think that needs, we need at our legislative um, meetings with our senators to really take a deep dive in that and look at it. Um, but tell me, so when we do, so their argument is, well, then use it. Um, Tell me why we're not. Tell me why we should be. Tell me why okay. we can't just get the money back. They, I, I, their staff, they probably have five or six lawyers. And I don't really know all that much about the the what kind of deals they've got with Lancaster County, other than it does seem to me that there are a lot of cases that they handle in Lancaster mm -hmm. County. When you talk to them, they, they will tell you they, they won't take misdemeanors. They don't want to do misdemeanors, um, so that takes a lot. They, they only want to do big cases. Big cases. Um, and typically, um, what I see across the state is that um, some of the counties have opted not to have a public defender because right. the statute only requires, you know, if you have a certain population. Um, the, the, I think the, the wider approach is a lot of the counties out there have kind of banded together and, and made, made uh, uh, a public defender's office. Now, sometimes it's a contract PD, and I'm not too hot on on that idea because it usually goes to the low bidder, which is not always the, the best, best way to go. Right. Um, and uh, you know, with 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 uh, only five or six lawyers, um, I don't know how they'd be of very much help to us. I know that I can tell you on this. 
Um, well, Don could probably tell you better. They they have a couple of cases, haven't they, up here? Yeah, I, I'm involved in a murder case uh, that's got a co-defendant, and originally what happened is Don and, Don and I have an agreement that if there's going to be multiple parties charged with an offense, well, I'll say, okay, who's the target defendant? So we keep that person and don't end up with someone that you're probably going to maybe turn state's evidence and, you know, the cost of a private attorney not trying the case is substantially less than if the person is trying the case. What happened in that case is the target defendant we got appointed to, and then uh, they appointed uh, outside counsel to the other defendant. And then the client that we had hired private attorney, and there really was no further conflict. And as the case progressed, um, the uh, private attorney that was hired was not really up, I don't think, up to speed. And the judge appointed Public Advocacy Commission to coach second chair mm -hmm. with him. And then that didn't work out, so the Public Advocacy Commission has that case. Um, I'm assuming that they're not charging the county for that, um, but I don't, I don't know. I'm assuming they are not. Okay. Um, and the court administrator would be, district court administrator would be in a better position to tell you. I, I would bet they're not charging uh, on that case. I don't know what the other one is uh, that they're involved in. Don can tell you about that, I'm sure. Um, we ended up getting back into it because they, they charged the other guy with, that we didn't have at first, to charge him with another murder, and I called the judge and said, we don't have a conflict in this anymore. So they appointed the us and relieved the other lawyers who were very apt, very good lawyers. Um, but, but because of the cost, they um, put, put us on it. And so, you know, the, their, their in a, involvement up here has been historically very, uh, very small Long. footprint. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of their stuff is either in Lincoln or in what they call Greater Nebraska, I guess. Right. Um, Which is what it was created for yeah, absolutely. to begin with. Yeah, yeah. But in, again, um, I understand the positions that these smaller counties are in and how these cases, sure. you know, the Norfolk case, I think, is what triggered it, if I remember it was, right. Actually, it was that... Be, uh, that oh, the Nebraska City one, wasn't the, it? With the cult? Yes. Ryan yes. and that. Yes. that yeah, that yes. Was, that, they bankrupted uh, right. whatever county that was. Yeah, Richardson, right. Yeah. yeah. So, well, but anyway, I guess I still think it's worth having that discussion um, in terms of um, the dollars that could be being used here um, that are down at the state. And I know there was a compromise the last time we talked about it, which was very close, where we could get half of it back. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'd like to talk about that um, I, I again hear you. and try and I, to... I think that would be a, you know, if you got half of it back, I mean, by, by a long shot, Douglas County is the largest contributor to that fund. Right. By, because every single case that's filed, including the case that Don files, right. Right. Um, go to, right. to that fund. So now it's probably 500. So well, and, and every, everything the city prosecutor more. files and yeah. Um, yeah. everything Johnny Corrigan files when yeah. he's uh, acting as a private attorney. Okay. So, yeah, if you could get some of that back, it would probably relieve uh, a little bit of the tension on the criminal justice costs here, up right. here. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and your staff for the hard work you do, and I've said that before a few years ago because I know you're here on weekends and now your people are here. I think what's important to at least state is, you know, this isn't something that we can put off. Basically, we're going to pay for it one way or another because we're mandated. I'm not certain all the citizens know when we do a budget, and it's nice to have Doug Kagan here from the Nebraska taxpayers. But if you weren't as committed as you are, and I'm not trying to be nice to you, I'm just being honest about it, if you weren't so passionate and committed as you are, what would be happening is the court would be appointing other attorneys and costing us more money than what 
you're asking for, and I stand to be corrected by any commissioner or citizen about that, uh, this budget is about 3% over 148000 over our target number that our good finance director, Joe Lorenz, provided with the 3% for the salaries. And it isn't, as I said, we are mandated to appoint someone as a public defender. It isn't something where we can say we're only going to do half of the county roads and we'll let those go for the next year. We can't do that. Nope. The U.S. Constitution. Period. The U.S. Constitution says if you're charged with a crime, you can go to jail, and can't afford an attorney. The government has to pay for it. End That's of story. right. End of story. And we're in a very tough position on the budget. Commissioner Boyle and I met earlier this morning with uh, Joe Lorenz talking about this. And the same thing's true with our correction facility. If we can't house them because we're overcrowded, we got to go out and contract somewhere else at a greater cost to do it. So uh, I just want to thank you for the extra work that you do. And honestly, uh, Tom, your passion uh, that I've seen since I've been here about trying to do the right thing is really appreciated. And I just felt that had to be stated. And I thank you for that. And uh, we'll continue to look at this and figure out how we deal with this challenge. All right. Well, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, I, I wasn't going to comment because all the questions I had were really dealt with in the interest of time, but uh, I can't sit here and be silent. Uh, I, I agree. You're, Tom, you're doing a terrific job. You always have. And um, I just want to thank you, really, for what you're doing. Uh, I have complete confidence in what you do. So thank you. Mine gets shaken sometimes, but yeah, thank I you. I understand. <laughs> I understand. How many years have you been in the company? Defender. Well, I've been in the office for 43 Wow. And I was chief deputy in 83 and then got elected in 96. So, yeah. I was, I was Roger's hype when I started this show. I was <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were a lot taller. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I've used that line a few times, haven't I? <laughs> well, you only have about 17 more years to go and you'll wrap it up. I don't plan. I don't plan. You know, that's one of the hard hard things is I, I'm one of these people that said I don't really want to quit until the job's done, and one of these days I guess I'm going to have to realize that this job ain't one that gets done. Yeah. Um, but until then, I'm just going to keep trucking along as best I can. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Commissioner Morgison. Well, we're, we're glad we <laughs> are, you're here with us, Tom. Um, but can when you talked about the ability to pay, do you feel that we're doing our absolute due diligence to determine whether someone has the ability to pay? Um, or could we improve a little bit on that? That's a, that's a court function and a court function alone. The, the statutes of the state of Nebraska prohibit us from commenting at all. Oh. We could know, let's, let's say um, we're, we have a client who, uh, when the judge makes the initial inquiry, the judge is satisfied that they don't have enough money to hire their own attorney. And then we find out um, that they inherited $2 million from a long-lost uncle or won the lottery. We cannot say anything about that. And the, the prosecutors are not really in a position to say anything about that either. That's a function for the court to handle and the court alone. Um, some judges are much more uh, inquisitive than others. Um, I, will be le I would be less than honest with you if I didn't say that. I think they have to take into consideration, and if you get charged with a serious felony, you better have some bucks um, or you're not going to be able to hire your own attorney. Obviously, if you get charged with a, a shoplifting or something, uh, you know, the cost is, is, isn't going to be prohibitive, although it, it's going to put a dent to anybody. Um, the other thing is judges, and with all due respect to all of them, hate pro se litigants. Mm -hmm. and. So if someone says, what I can't that, afford to turn. <laughs> What's that? What does that mean in English? <laughs> Pro se litigants are people who are representing themselves. Okay. Um, so let's say the guy gets arraigned and judge says, uh, do you have a job? Yeah. How much you make? 14 bucks an hour. Um, do you have kids? No. Uh, 
And the judge said, you know what, I think you can hire your own attorney. Well, Delicious. next court appearance, the guy shows up and he doesn't have an attorney and he says, well, I tried to hire someone and I didn't, they, they wanted X amount up front and I didn't have it. So the judge is put in a position of, okay, do I have this guy represent himself, which is a very, not a very good use of time because they don't typically know um, and uh, what to do. And so a lot of times they'll kind of say, okay, well, public defender's appointed, um, just so they can move the case along. And I, you know, I, 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 the, the thought of having people trying to represent themselves when they really can't, can't make it, um, that, that bothers me. I don't want to see people, you know, getting charged with crime and going to, going to jail or prison that, um, aren't, aren't able to hire their own attorney because, yeah, they may have a job. I think the statute says that you're indigent for purposes of appointment of counsel if uh, paying an attorney would deprive you of the, the uh, normal necessities of life. And that, that changes from person to person. You know, obviously a single right. person who's 30 years old and making 20, 25 or 35 grand probably can't afford um, to defend a murder case, but could probably afford to defend a misdemeanor or a lower grade felony. So that, it, it's, it's not as simple as sometimes we might think. And like I say, most times the judges go to come down on the side of, well, I'm gonna appoint a public defender. And, and the, the, the flip side of that coin is, most people would rather hire their own lawyer. We're not their lawyer of choice. And most people honestly would rather hire their own lawyer than have us. So there, there's a balance that goes on. And I think that's the, part of the equation that the judges Go, hey, you know, if this person could really afford an attorney, they'd probably hire one. So but it, it's, a, it's not a simple, a simple um, math thing. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, Tom, you have no more questions right now, but hold on because I'm going to have some. Okay, all right. Don, we'll Don you want to come up? Good morning. Don Klein, Douglas County Attorney, uh, here because we are our, uh, our target. We missed our target. We're, we're asking for about three hundred eighty thousand dollars more than our target, which is about four percent. Um, the first thing I'd say is, is I, I agree with Tom. We're, we're very, you're very fortunate that we have the kind of staff that we do with the public defender's office and the county attorney's office because they're quite frankly, if we went to uh, uh, best practices on caseloads for either one of our offices, uh, we, would, we would be way over uh, for each office with regard to the numbers that uh, on the load our, our people are carrying. But they're willing to do it and they work very hard and, and they do a great job. Uh, the, the numbers I'm asking for, I'm not asking for anybody else, although I probably should be, uh, it's, it's all involved with costs. Uh, if, you, if you had that, that handout I gave you, I think I shared it with Tom. Maybe it's part of what he used also. It's in the it's in the um, electronic. It's our numbers electronic. are going to be a, our numbers are going to be a little bit different than his exactly because we handle all the cases. Uh, they handle the portion of people who are indigent. So if somebody's re represented by private counsel, then that's 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 going to be an additional. But we reviewed. If you looked at, at those numbers, we reviewed ten thousand cases. Uh, in, in 2017. And by that means, we get referrals from the Omaha Police Department, the Douglas County Sheriff, the DEA, the FBI, the Valley, Boys Town, Ralston, Omaha Fire, uh, all those different departments. So if you look at the increase just in the numbers that we reviewed, in 2015, we reviewed 6,770 cases. In 17, we reviewed almost 10,000 cases. And out of those 10,000 reviews, we filed 4,430, uh, which is an increase of 348 more felony filings from, from uh, the year before. So it's just, it's as simple as that. There's a, a, an increase uh, in the number of cases that we're hi filing. And obviously there's an increase in court costs. There's a filing fee that we pay for county court. There's a filing fee that we pay for district court. So the additional cases, additional filing fees, and that's what I'm asking for because I know that that's going to be an increase in, in our budget. Also, we did 474 autopsies last year, which is an increase of, uh, let's see here, 
uh, from 356 the year before. You know, just the number of people, uh, the cases that we have. So that's, a, that's uh, at a minimum at $1,200 that we pay to doctors in autopsy, which is by far a, 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 a small expert fee that we're paying. If that went to the med center or somewhere, we'd be paying $3,500, $4,000 per autopsy, and we pay $1,200 to our docs. Uh, who do a great job, but, but those are increased expenses uh, that we have when we have autopsies increase, we have filing fees increase, and so I, I'm just, we, we just figure things out, Lance did, and, and court-related costs, county court costs, autopsy and toxicology and district court costs are, are what I'm asking for, budgeting for, that's that increase there, not for any other employees at this point in time uh, to handle those, those extra cases, but just, be, just to cover the costs. Uh, that we have to pay that I don't have any control over uh, unless you want me to start coming to you and asking you do you want me to autopsy this case or do you want me to fi file this case and that's of course I'm just you know joking but that's that's I mean pinky used to say that at times I mean my, my first boss a long time ago do I have to go to the board and ask them if I should uh, do as a coroner do an autopsy on this case because we don't have the money in our budget so you know, those are, it's very, very simple, it's very straightforward. There's an increase in costs. You see the work that our civil division done, does for you uh, with Teresa and the cases that we handle there. Our juvenile division, Nicole's here, uh, the tremendous caseload that we have there. And then obviously the felonies. We do, like I said, all the felonies. Uh, we also do all the misdemeanor domestic violence cases. We took those from the city uh, a while back. Uh, we have, uh, also do all the misdemeanor motor vehicle homicides uh, as far as misdemeanors go. But we've kind of divided up our office into certain areas and uh, as I'm sure Tom has also with regard to expertise, uh, more experienced lawyer, lawyers handling the more, more higher profile, high, serious cases, which we have plenty of them. You read the, you read the newspaper, you see the news. Uh, the kind of cases we handle are the cases that your constituents and our constituents care about, uh, uh, have a great concern for regard to, first of all, public safety, and second of all, the, to make sure people have adequate representation when they're, they're charged with a crime. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. I, I'll be happy to go into anything in, in any more detail if you want me to, but what we're asking for is just simply to cover costs so that I'm not coming back here next year in the middle of the year asking for a, uh, you know, a, a more money because our costs are so high that, that they've gone up and we can't cover them. And, I've, and to some extent, I've been you know, maneuvering money around, trying to be a good soldier by not hiring people immediately, by, by leaving maybe a gap for a period of time. Uh, but we can't afford to do that. Uh, you know, right now, I think uh, we had Chad Brown, who just got named a juvenile court judge, uh, Jake Ennenbach's leaving our office to go into private practice for more money. Uh, uh, we had a, a person, another person leave the juvenile court uh, staff to go work for the district court judges. Uh, we had another lawyer that moved to Las Vegas that I haven't hired any replacements for those people yet just to try and save a little bit of money you know, in, in increments here so, so that we can make our budget uh, because we always have uh, tried to do the best we can to be good soldiers and, and come in and not have to ask for any, any, any uh, supplement for our budget. So, yes. Commissioner Boyle, then Morgan. Uh, Don, I want to ask you, on the, I think it's on your last page, uh, it's proposed budget and it's 2018 slash 2019 difference. Um, can, you, uh, can you tell, uh, it's cost center 42315 and goes on to, ends with 42398. I think it's, it must be on the next page. Right, right, it's, okay. it's, it's this page here. All right, yeah, I want to ask you on the, uh, uh, what are the first one, 42315, court and related costs? Are those filing fees? No, the filing fees are the district court costs and the county court costs. The court okay. and related costs are other expert witness fees, professional okay. fees, uh, anything to do with that. Okay, great. And then the, the district court, and of course, the county, we have to pay filing, you have to pay filing fees, don't you? Right. Every case that we file, we pay a, pay a filing fee for the county court, and we pay a right. filing fee, and then, then when the case is in the district court. So uh, first degree murder, you have to pay a filing fee, which is pretty incredible. But I know that it's linked to the, because we talked about this before, it's linked to the judge's retirement, which is going to be next to impossible to get out of. I mean, they're not going to I, I think a portion of that goes to them. A portion yeah. of it goes to the Public Advocacy Commission. A portion goes to yeah. different areas within okay. the 
state budget also. All right. And um, then I want to ask about uh, on the autopsies on 40, 42, 338. Sure. Autopsies and toxology. toxology. Are those, um, you're doing those for other counties and then you build them as a? That doesn't include those. Oh, okay. That, there's nothing on there about those out of county autopsies. This is oh. just Douglas County. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Morgan. Okay, John, thank you. Uh, you for your presentation, appreciate it, and also the work that you and Tom do in opposite uh, directions, but at the same time, the, the commitment that you have and your department has and your people. Um, it'd be good for us and not for uh, Don to do it, but to look at those fees and how much we're now paying the state from what we were paying each year because you're telling us hey this 400,000 thereabouts 480 whatever is not going to hire some new people it's these filing fees and and so on and goes into that retirement fund too so uh, uh, Mr. Lorenz Joe we might want to uh, at least look at what we're increasing uh, monies to the state so that it's known that we're paying here in Douglas County again. I'm sure we, uh, I'm sure we can get those so, figures exactly. Yeah, and I don't want you to waste time doing that. I guess whatever we can do to get some of those numbers, uh, we'll work at getting that just so we know. Sure. And then on the coroner, um, and those cost increases, uh, we'll talk about that some as we did this morning, Commissioner Boyle, on the coroner situation. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I got something for you and Tom. So let's, uh, I guess my first request is, can you all, somebody provide me, I don't need exact science to the penny, but I need a separate breakdown of what's spent in juvenile court, what's spent on juvenile. When so you say what's can, spent, I mean, do you ask for filing fees or? or uh, everything that assigns to it. You got a separate division, so hopefully it's a little easier. I mean, from salaries to fees, some approximate idea of what's spent separately on juvenile. I can I can get that breakdown for you, Tom. As far as our office goes, um, we only have a, a couple of lawyers that only do juvenile court. Um, I can give you the salaries of the lawyers who do cases in juvenile court, as long as you keep in mind that they also do some felonies as well. Um, and as far as other costs go, um, the only additional cost up there would be um, if we do an independent psychiatric evaluation, uh, which is rare because the, the state is usually doing numerous evals. Um, and when we do depositions, um, which would probably in most cases be more likely to occur in what I call those parent cases, mm -hmm. uh, not in the delinquency cases. The, you know, the, the workload at, from our office standpoint in juvenile court um, is, is primarily uh, with the delinquency cases. We do have parent cases as well, as I said. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty much in court time. That, that's what, what it is. Like I said, I'll be happy to give you the salaries and say, here's, here's how many, uh, of these lawyers devote their entire time to juvenile court, and here's um, the lawyers that don't, and what their average felony caseload would be. I can do that. Is okay. that acceptable? That's fine. I, like I said, I don't want the penny, but I want some idea of out of uh, Don a nine million dollar budget and a five million dollar budget. What what's the cost? If it's sure. two million, there. Okay. So my second line is. So for the county attorney in 2016, there was a 3.9 percent ax. 2017, a 6.3 percent ax. 2018, a 6.2. This year, 6.5. Public defenders ax in 2016, 5.7 increase. 8.7 increase in 2017. 8.5 increase in 2018. This year, 4.3. So we've had a conversation about this, and this is uh, the pre-detention hearings that's been happening a couple of years. We've met a couple of times about those. And we've talked and they've started and stopped in my understanding, you were there. 
What are you talking about the percentage? I didn't get what you meant there. Were you talking about the percentage? Uh, what's what's uh, the amount spent? Not, not so much. Well, when I'm saying percentage, this this is the percentage askers that you've asked before the board, board budget wise for, for budget. budget increases. Totally. And to say that, let me add my comments on everybody else that I, before I go to the questions, I appreciate the work done by everybody in office um, and agree with everybody said. But with that said, for we met at least a couple of times to talk about the, the pre-detention hearings before juvenile court that were we were trying to have calls on at 11 o'clock. On two occasions, they've started and stopped or for whatever reasons, not there. So my point is, I think the board's been pretty good in trying to grant you all's requests before you what you need. So I've tried to educate them data-wise, and my request is, you know, if you all want six figures, I want 20 minutes a day to try to have these hearings, and I need you all to commit to them. Because for the last, I don't understand why, I mean, I understand things are crunched, but Tom, like you said, you know, you do the work you need to do. And from my understanding, everything's proven that if you have these hearings, it could save 10 days or so when we did the last count on it in detention. But for some reason, for the last four years, and these are four years worth of numbers I'm quoting, we can't make these meetings happen. So I, I want to ask you all publicly to have these meetings unequivocally, find a way to make it work. I'm not saying you do a pattern, but the fact you do a certain deal, but I need a commitment to have these meetings. I, uh, I can tell you uh, that I've had meetings that you participated in and others where you were not present. That was more with court, court personnel. And I have told them constantly that we will go back to doing it if the judges will block the people out for that period of time. So for that 20 minutes, what I, what I would like to do is have the judges say, the, I, what, I could, what I told them I would do is I will give them the lawyer that is responsible for the detentions for the whole week. For, I'll give them the whole year's assignment. And all I asked them to do was not double book, triple book those lawyers for that short period of time. They refused to do it. I, like I said earlier, I can't have situations where a 14-year-old kid is coming to court and going, are you my lawyer today? Are you my lawyer? You're not the same person that was here last week. That's all. That, Oh, if you can if you can get the judges to do that, I'm all in. I told them I would do it. I, I don't necessarily agree that it's going to make a big difference. We've done a we've done a hell of a lot of work right now. I mean, if you look at the, the youth center, um, what with all the work we've done, the youth center is what half full now compared to what it was four or five no, years ago. It's, it's more numbers than it is. But this this my this is my question to you for that point. I heard that scheduled question a couple of times, and I could only go about two or three questions deep. So in trying to ask and get an idea of what happens, this is, this is my understanding to both of you all. This is how it happened. My understanding a couple of years ago that there was a study or something done in juvenile court about the scheduling software. But there used to be a software that you schedule time in. My understanding is after this study, all the parties involved agreed not to do the scheduling through that software. Some people may do it, some people may not. And I've talked to a couple of judges to ask this question. My understanding is the process is supposed to be after hearings, detention hearings, or whatever it is, all the parties go to the bailiff and they set a calendar. Okay. But my understanding is that if the bail, if you don't do that, the bailiff then puts you on a calendar. My understanding is the process that was agreed to is not being followed by the parties. Yeah, so the party when so when the bailiff then, when you don't go to them and set up a schedule, when the bailiff puts you on a schedule, you can't come back to me with the argument and say it's the calendar when you're not adhering to the original process. I will go up there and get my head handed to me if I'm advocating for you all for a calendar and people aren't following the process that was agreed to. They aren't the ones. The, the bailiffs are the ones that aren't following the, pro, the program. I am not going to sit here and tell you that every single time that someone goes to the bailiff afterwards, part of the reason is because they've been double booked already and they don't have the time to do it because they have to go to another courtroom immediately after the other one because 
Judge X is screaming at, at, at uh, the lawyers in Judge Y's courtroom, why aren't you here? If we continue to do this kind of stuff where we have cattle calls at, every, okay, everyone gets set for 9 o'clock. So you, you go up there and you'll see 12 or 13 lawyers standing around uh, and one case being called. So everyone's going to be there at 9 o'clock until they get done. Courtroom B doesn't care about that because they've got a cattle call going too on all these check hearings and all these other things. I, I, I can tell you that you know they have the same problem that we do, but mine is a little different in that we represent that, that kid, that human being who doesn't deserve to have multiple lawyers showing up. And uh, you know, if, if you want to go up, I'll go up with you. I'll be happy to and face any of the bailiffs or judges that are saying that we're not doing what we're supposed to do and call them out. They're saying it's hard. I'm, I'm just saying, I, I'm just hearing the size of it. They're saying, now in one meeting they said, don't blame us for the groups not being able to get together real quick before the peace. And my understanding on their end is that they say, the term I hear is that's, that's just a part of lawyering. So I don't, I don't have any problem doing that, but the fact is, is that there's not a lot of leverage you have on them. That's right. And so I'm not saying you do it because my understanding is probation is offered to do it at different times, offered to do it then, but the group needs to meet to find out what the formula is that succeeds. We also told them we'd do it over the lunch hour where there wasn't double booking, and they decided they didn't want to do that either. I mean, I didn't, we're, we're I didn't hear that. But well, I, I, if I, you all, I, I I'm just asking, I want, if you all tell me that it is that you are going to do it, then that can be worked on. But I need you all to be there, not negotiating. We'll do it for 60 days. I need it to be there because you need to work through the process to do it, and you can't start and stop it. Well, what I, what I will tell you is I'll commit to doing it, but if, if we get to the point where it's not productive, I'm going to speak up and say, hey, we have lawyers that have work to do, and if this is not productive, what is the point of doing it? But I, I'm not just going to pull out. I would, I would talk about it and say, here's what the problems are. Here's what the issues are. The, you know, the, the juvenile court, has, in my four decades here, has been very stubborn about adhering to how it's my way or the highway. And you're right, Don and I don't have much leverage over them. And we, we keep saying, don't double book us. Don't do that. And they continue to do it. Um, and what am I, I, what am I gonna do? I they agree. Say, well, get, well, go get someone else to represent Johnny. And well, the someone else, if they have to send someone else, they don't know about the case. If I have to send someone else, they don't know about the case. So we sit there and, Your Honor, can we continue this two more weeks, please? And the kid sits in the, the youth center for two more weeks. That's the problem. So let me ask you a question about that piece of it, about assigning it. So let me, let me use an analogy. Um, basketball team. Coach has players. Players go in the game. That player is expected to fulfill that role or position. I'm not a lawyer, but this is my understanding is that it's a principal understanding or that if a person gets a case, the person should be ready to handle the case. Just like if a black person goes in the game, you got to be ready to play. There's no deal. What happened to the, what happened to you saying, basically you're saying if the person assigned to the case doesn't have the case, you can't move. But my understanding is if you get the case, you need to be ready to make the call. Well, yeah, if you, if you're there, that's the point is, is you're getting, you, you're, you're, if a judge tells the bailiff or someone else, go to, go to the other courtroom where our lawyer is, in, is standing, waiting in line to get to their case or is adjudicating a case and say, hey, judge so-and-so needs you down in courtroom three. You say, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of this. I can't leave here. We'll get someone else to do it then. Go get, oh, there are two other public defenders standing here. Go get them to do it. Well, then nothing gets done. Don, am I wrong? Go ahead. If I could answer, could I answer also? Go. Yeah, well, I mean, no, it was just well, we, I wanted to make it fresh while, the, while it was brought up. Well, so. well, first of all, with regard to commitment, you and I have spoke before. In the end of November, we committed to doing this phone call thing, and it never happened. Okay, so. My know. understanding, but, in, and Nicole, step up, because it's my understanding. My understanding, because there was an exchange, and I saw the exchange and said, okay, you committed to doing it. 
but then we wanted to negotiate that we just do it for 60 days. And this is what I'm saying. I understand the issue, but you can't come into it that we'll do it for a certain amount of time and see if it works. The question well, is, exactly. you need to do it well, to make it work. See if it works. Yeah, but, but, we but you need to do it to, to make it work. To see if it would work. Uh, but you can't be negotiating times. If it's an issue with doing it at lunch, then we have to talk to that. But you, we can't go into it like it's 30 days. If it doesn't work after 30 days, it's not because it's not going to just probably work in 30 days. It needs time to make itself flow. That, that's fine with me. Except, okay. but, I, but I want to be able to say after X amount of time, if it's not working, this is not. Then you should change it. You should find how it changes, not stop it. That's a, I would should be option one. Okay, well, that's different than, I just want to make sure that's different than saying stop it. It's Let's find a way to make it work. Because tomorrow, a group of us are getting ready, and I'm not, I don't want to blame you. Your court's overloaded, okay? Tomorrow, a group of us are trying to go to South Dakota to see how this functions in another place. So once this comes back, there will be suggestions, and I need everybody to be on all in on how and, it works. And one of my deputies is going They are. But nobody from your office is going to. But from the standpoint of, if you look at, at when, I, I'm just talking about when I started mm -hmm. here, 2007, and the census at the Juvenile Detention Center then to where it is now, it's, 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 a, it's a tremendous improvement. It's like 50 percent of, uh, of what it was before with regard to detention. And I also talked to uh, one of the judges last Friday about the average length of stay issue question and uh, the judge told me and said that Karen Shin, who was also an expert that was brought in here, said that the way we keep our numbers is wrong because you're not including people who are street released immediately from, uh, the, the, you know, not going into detention at all. The people who are street released aren't included on the statistics. And that makes a big difference, obviously, in, in what the length of stay looks like. The judge has told me that, and Karen Shin has told me that also, that that's not included in the in the numbers, those people who are street released immediately aren't included. Well, they're never they're never detained, so they should be part of the statistics also. And let me let me clarify those numbers because those are all the numbers. There's there's two sets. With the JDAI, there's the QRS, which the board has been brought and they understand. The numbers you're talking about are overall numbers that include people that get out in 24 hours. With the JDAI's numbers and how the process is set to the QRS, it excludes those and it just counts juveniles. From those numbers, our, our case processing, the possibility of case processing could help reduce some of the time of stay. Now, I'm not saying it's all, because the point you made in one meeting was the psychology deal. That's another piece. There's other points in the process. But the best example to use, Nebraska had the spring, spring football game this week. The coach said, we got the best time in the world. If we don't block, if we're weaker than the other team, it don't give it don't matter. All the other stuff going on, this pre-detention hearing is like ground one. And from those numbers that they have through the QRS, and there's another study uh, that was done by a student, it says, it, it produced a result that said, if you all get together, there's a possibly a 10 days less time. And all I'm asking is to get together because there's been things said, you know, like the study is not validated. The study's good enough to be raising an eyebrow and all I'm asking. I'm just asking, find 20 minutes to get together, stay committed to the process to make it work, and don't opt out after a certain amount of days if it's not. If it's, if it's not going there, I need the group to work together because there's no way, because th there's been some, there's going to be some plans to try to get you all in the room together and just have it out. Because well, I've heard it from both ends, but. There's not a problem between our office and Mr. Riley's office. No, no, it's not no, no, no. It's, you, it's the group together. and the judges because I, I've tried to understand this thing from both ends. And I have, I will more than like, I gladly argue that case because no matter if we get in the room, there's a different power dynamic. The board is on another pier with the judges. You all have to go before them. You can say your point, but there's a whole different power dynamic. I'm fine to make the ask, but I can't make the ask if you all aren't having the meetings because the fallback will say, you all aren't even having the meetings. Why should we do this? All right. Well, we understand. and we're, we're committed to trying, but to do this, but I mean, there is a there is a fundamental difference, as Thomas stated, between his. I can interchange somebody a lot easier than he can with regard to the case. He's got a client. I, I can send somebody there who can cover for somebody else who might know a little bit about the case, look at the file, and be able to go to that hearing. I don't think that's that luxury that you have. It's, it's, yeah. If you, when I hear the word coverage, it's fingernail down the blackboard for me. That's, 
I don't want coverage. I want the person who designed this case. And don't forget, when we're talking about this pre-detention thing, no one is signed to the case yet. I mean, this is the first, this is before the first court appearance, right? Let me ask you, so you made a, you made a, and I'm going to give it up and come back to it. Nobody's assigned to it. I'm not a, but from my understanding is, you said you don't have issues in discovery. I'm assuming that was adult. Do you have issues in discovery in juvenile? No. No. No, we don't. I don't. Okay. We had a few. That's not what I hear, but I'll take it. We had a few issues that we've ironed out because we sat in the room and figured it out. And that's, that's all. And, you know, don't get me going on discovery because it's not these guys that usually are causing the problems. It's further down on 15th and Howard that's causing the problems on the discovery. They can only give me what they get. And that whole, whether it's a juvenile court case or an adult case, it's the same source. And, but that's my point with it because it's been four years. And my thought is if we could have gotten in the room and make the thing, whoa, we could have been there. And I don't, I don't doubt any of your issues with time, but it's like everybody else in the country can do it. And they probably got issues too. So after four years, I'm like, um, I hear nails on the chalkboard when I hear this after four years and we can't make it work. Well, I think we need to look forward, not backward. I certainly agree with that. I'm more looking forward, but I need to look backwards so I can set the stage to make the ask. And I'm, and I'm saying the board's going to get these quality QRS reports and I'm asking you on the public to commit to it. I'm assuming you are. Okay. Cause when these reports come, the question I'm going to ask what's going on with the meetings. Okay. And I like, I'll do the same thing, but I just, I just want to make one comment about this. When one of the issues that we've had about this is the difference between 53 days and 45 days or something to that effect. And I don't see how that is germane. If the difference was 10 days to one day at the beginning of the, of the, of the, uh, detention, that would make sense to me. If someone's in for 45 and 53, I don't see a correlation there. And that's why I've had problems with it. Well, this is what a correlation is today. Cause you all talking budget because the price now is $303 a day. So for 10 days, that adds up when you got 96 saying, if you could show me yeah. if you could show me how 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 this impacts the difference between 45 days and 53 days that that's one thing if you were telling me if you if you participated in these calls the the kid would get out in one or two days but since you don't participate in the call the kid there for 10 days then I'd say, okay, I see the correlation between the calls and the length of stay. When you're telling me there's a difference between 48 days and 53 days, I just don't see the correlation. That's that's my issue. I got that, and I'll show it to you. Well, and the other the other thing to, to point out is that we don't that the judge makes the determination about detaining somebody, and they ain't part of the not us call. But ha half the half the battle, my understanding is. And this is what happened in a public meeting is that half the battle is at some point you all got to get together and kind of present a option for this kid if you all worked it out. So if you haven't gotten together before the deal, you have to wait and then get together sometime and give the judge a result. Just remember, Am I wrong in understanding that? Just remember one thing. We're not the guardian ad litem of the child. We're, we're the child's lawyer. And if the child says, I don't want to go to Boys Town, I don't want to go to some group home, I want to go home. We have to advocate for that, even if we don't think it's necessarily in the kid's best interest. That's what a guardian of the litem does. So the, if, if they want detention and our kid says, I want to go home, that's what we advocate for. And we don't have a choice to, to, to say, you know what, I, I, at a meeting before, beforehand, I, I think the kid would be best off at Boys Town instead of going home to because his mom's a drug addict or whatever. That's not something we can, we can do. If the kid says, I want to go home, that's our obligation. Just like if I, I go to an adult sentencing and my client who's charged with four counts of robbery and four counts of use of a firearm says, I want you to advocate for probation. I'll tell them the chances of getting probation are about like me dunking a basketball. And, uh, but if he insists that that's what he wants us to do, that's kind of what we have to do. We don't have that choice. So that's, there's a difference there. Um, that, as to what we can and can't do, and what we can't agree to something on behalf of our client that the client doesn't want. I relinquish and come back, Nicole. You like you want to get in? Then I'll go to Commissioner Boyle and then Commissioner Borgeson. Nicole, do you have anything to add? 
Go ahead. Excuse me. May I do that? Someone wants to say. You know, you're next. I just want to say, okay. I say Nicole, you might jump what in. I want to say, go what, I, what I want to say, I'll say earlier when we discussed this uh, this morning before the meeting. Uh, it's my opinion. I have very limited experience uh, in juvenile court, and I have been involved in those cattle calls, and it's really unbelievable. Uh, what I what I want to ask is, uh, with my limited experience, uh, when I was practicing in uh, uh, district court, uh, there was a pro progression calendar that helped a great deal. I mean, it uh, when I started practicing, there was no progression calendar. It was a free for all. I mean, I was given cases that had been filed seven years in advance, and you know, it was nuts. Anyway, the point is that I wonder whether I'd like to ask you. Uh, it's my opinion that the responsibility for all of this. Uh, and I don't want to be bashing the court because we've been accused of that in the past. But the judges are in charge of all these things. I mean, you, you are uh, very important players in the system. Uh, and the attorneys as well that come up there are, are at the uh, beck and call of the court system. And so if you don't have something that uh, the judges don't have something that they have to do, uh, they'll do it any way they want to. And they'll do these calls all the time and conflicting where everybody has to be at different places at different times. And I've gone in and I had a client that was supposed to get some kind of a psychiatric uh, study done and the person in charge of it from H Department of Health and Human Services was gone. So it's postponed for two months to get it. And so this kid lingers. I mean, it's, it's outrageous what happens. So I am going to, this is not bashing, but I lay it at the feet of the judges. They have to get control of this system so that your lawyers are representing that they don't have all these people walking in and strangers trying to speak for them. It doesn't work. So I would like to do whatever I can, um, uh, and I think the board does as well. We want to see this function in a way that serves the clients best. And you are the folks who can tell us how to do that. And I promise you that I will do everything I can to try to make this system work in the, so that it's the best interest of the child and the clients. So that's what I say. And let me know, let us know what we can do to make this happen if we possibly can. Maybe it's a progression calendar of some sort. Maybe that's naive. I don't know. But you let us know. You're the experts. When you speak of the courts, I just start off with that when you name four years, this goes back approximately two years, and I, I want to share this with all of you because I don't know if everyone knows this, but we were participating, the Douglas County Attorney's Office Juvenile Division was participating in the phone calls, and everybody is in agreement, all parties, that we are participating at 98%. That means every single day, the lead they kept track for a 12-month period of time, that we are on 98% of the calls, and that's a lot of calls. And you speak of a judge. On the record, after one of the calls, we had a judge, quote, say, I could care less about your damn phone call. Continue to say, yes, I think it is clear to everybody that not any piece of information provided to the court today by the legal parties has been accurate or reliable. These phone calls are not productive. Someone needs to take charge, and that someone needs to be the state, since the state is the movement in all of these. And I'm all for collaboration, but not when collaboration removes accountability and ultimate decision making. Because then all anybody does is blame the we rather than the I. And that's what happened to our office when someone participated in a phone call and relied on the information that was given in that phone call and went in to cover a hearing. And based on that criticism that we received, after the 98% participation and being told that they're not protect productive and that we're relying on bad information, we took a break from those calls. This was last August, this was August of 2016, that hearing. We started working then throughout 2017 on how we could make those calls better. In the beginning of 2017, uh, we had a meeting, Don, Tom, myself, Commissioner Rogers, there were several other people in the room, and the way we left the meeting was that you and some of the others that participated in the meeting were going to go back to the judges and see if you could accommodate what Don and Tom had said here today. Nobody reached back out to us. At least four months went by, and I sat at an OIS meeting in June of 2017 last year and heard repeated criticism about our offices, both our offices not participating in the phone calls, but we had never heard back from the meeting three months before. So on that day, 
I did an email to every single person on the OIS committee indicated that I had just talked to Don and Tom and that we would start phone calls the following business day at noon so that we could all be present on the calls. We were told no. Several more months went by and we met on November 22nd of 2017, the day before Thanksgiving in Judge Daniels courtroom. I was there, Judge Daniels was there, Joy was there, other people were there and the agreement was made. Tom was there. On Monday, we will begin the phone calls at noon. We would like to do this for a four week period of time so that we can check back with one another and see if they're productive, if they're substantive, if there's a benefit for all parties involved. I went back and told Don that very day, we're committed to doing it starting Monday. That was November 22nd. And since that day, still through today, they have not began. And I'm told meeting after meeting after meeting that it said that our two officers are not participating in the phone calls. When we've been willing to participate in the phone calls for almost 12 months now, admittedly having taken a break because of what was said to us on the record and because we didn't want to participate in something that was, then we're being called, that we're not being held accountable, we're giving away our decision making powers and that the information is not reliable. And when you talk about the hearings, I want to tell you that what was agreed to as far as scheduling is not happening. And I can definitely tell you it's not because of the Douglas County Attorney's Office. And I can tell you that there's attorneys working on Saturdays and Sundays on a regular basis as well. And I can tell you that they post their calendar conflicts every single Thursday and cover for each other. And at this time, there's approximately 10 of them providing coverage for each other. They're covering 150 calendar conflicts per week. That's in addition to their own caseloads that are anywhere from 200 to over 300. So in addition to their cases, they're posting, I'm double booked, I'm triple booked, I have an 1184 meeting, I have to go order, argue in front of the Nebraska State Supreme, the Supreme Court, I have to argue in front of the Court of Appeals, I have to be at a deposition. Again, I'm double booked, I'm triple booked. Would someone please help me cover these 10 to 15 hearings that I can't do myself this week? <coughs> They post those and then they all cover for each other. And when someone's stuck in the courtroom because the judges do not run on schedule, we have a text string and they're texting. All of us are on the one string. I'm stuck here. Can someone please go here? And they are a team and they work exceptionally hard. Seven days a week responding to emails and texts evenings and weekends because the cases continue, the removals continue on evenings and weekends. And never does any of them not respond or not say, how can I help? Whether or not, again, it's at night or on the weekends or during the day because someone's double or triple booked. They pick it up and they go do the best they can. So our office, we want to work with everybody, every agency from CPS to probation to public defender's office. We want to participate in productive phone calls that will benefit juveniles. That's our commitment, our dedication, and our desire. We simply want it to be the best that it can be. And at noon works, even though they won't even get to eat lunch because they know they know that case. Because a lot of them coming in at detention hearings are the warrants and runaways, so those do have an assigned attorney. They simply want to be the ones on the call so they can say, this is what I know, so it's productive. And then they want to be the one to go into their hearing that afternoon so they know what was said on the call. So let me say thank you for that. Let me, and let me back up because let me recall what I recall from that. I, I don't recall committing to getting with the judges because my point has always been, I can't sit down with them unless you all agree to meet consistently. So if that's the case, I'm, I'm fine with that. I remember the discussion up there in 903, but I, I'll take that hit. The point of the meetings, my understanding is, yeah, you, you the, th the thing about getting together, I think we have some case process from Casey. I can get that clear. So that's, we'll go from there. But yeah, I, I agree. Everybody says you have a 98, 97% attendance rate. 
But then I go back to the question I ask about, can you make the call? Are you ready to play when you get in the game? Yeah, you're showing up 98%, but the person that shows up is not ready to play. Meaning, my understanding is, if a person has, may, may not be their case, you show up on the call, but when you show up on the call, be ready to play. You can't come in the game and say, it's not my position. So that's my understanding with the 98%. I don't doubt the commitment at all. The only thing I'm saying is, to your point of the email exchange, I remember one email exchange, and after we walked out of the, e the meeting, the email exchange was, it was like a negotiation, a, a starting volley of a negotiation to do them. And what I'm asking is, I don't want to negotiate. I want the group to agree to do them, and let's keep doing them until we make it work. I hear your point with the judges, and I'm sure they will hear it now, so this is the first stake, because I'm going to just tell you, this is my point for the year. In every meeting, it's going to come up because there's no way as accomplished as you all are, as hard as you work, that we can't find a way to make it work. And that's all I'm asking. Commissioner Borgs. Well, I, I think Wait, it's, my, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so it's my, Commissioner Borgs was first, then you. Oh, well, my, mine's going off in a little bit different direction because of listening to everything that's been said. This is, again, one of those. Um, where I think everybody had very good intentions in building what we have as a juvenile system right now. My personal opinion from even sitting up in those courtrooms and watching um, for a few hours here and there, there's way too many people involved in these cases. Way too many. And, you know, you can sit there and you can hear five people on this side and five people on that side, and then finally you're hearing from the child and their parents and everybody's talking in different directions. And, again, it's, to me, it's craziness. And so if there were a study to be done, if there were some reforms to be done, I honest to God believe we should start looking at the fact that there's too many people involved in the case. And that, I think, would move things along um, a lot better as well. The other issue is, and um, maybe it's a meeting with um, Chief Hevekin um, again about the juvenile court and the calendaring issue. Um, that may be something that um, Commissioner Rogers and I can have with him um, because, it, again, everybody is affected by it, it within the system and so if nobody knows what that real true calendaring is and i know they're doing a little better job of it but um maybe we need to talk to them about that as well can i say something about that come on uh you're one thousand percent correct there are too many cooks spoiling the broth unfortunately most of them are statutorily required so it takes legislative uh, action to undo it. What I, what my experiences have been, and I, you know, I don't go up there as much as, as probably Don does, and I'm certainly not up there. And I echo everything Nicole said. I only wanted to give you a standing O, because uh, you're right. But what, what, what the, what the real problem is, uh, one of the problems is, because there's so many players, there's so many substitutes up there. So someone from HHS comes doesn't know anything about the case. Someone from probation office, it's, a, it's all this coverage stuff that we, we're just talking about. So the lawyers could be the, the lawyers that are handling the case and they're ready to go and they know what's going on, but uh, the HHS caseworker is, is brand new and didn't get the evaluation done. So like Commissioner Boyle said, two months later, we're back doing the same thing. Or someone from the probation office. Done. I mean, the turnover in both of those places has been astronomical. Uh, and then when you have guardians ad litem, you have you know, foster care review people, I mean, it's, it's well, chaos. And, and here's my, um, th this is how I look at systems, and maybe it's a little bit too simplistic, but I sit here and I think, um, would this system, if that was my child, would that be okay? And my answer is no, it would not. It would not be okay if it was my child that was sitting wherever they are within the system. So why is it okay? Why are we prolonging any change or reform to this for everybody else's child within this county? And so that's 
that's my drive is to try to figure out how to streamline the system and again I think everybody had great intentions when they were looking at the systems making sure that the child had what the child needed or the family had what they needed but we never when we kept adding we never went back to see if what we had was working and now I think we just have a whole lot of people fumbling over each other um, in causing a, a much more longer length of the process than need be so anyway I think we still need to look at that um, all of the players legislatively and say whether or not they are all needed um, and again not to try to um, take away what the child or family needs but my goodness it is it is craziness up there when you sit in those courtrooms and see how many people have their fingers and um, opinions in that case so I, I, I call your attention to uh, since I've been here there have been four or five studies of juvenile court and the most recent one was probably five six seven years ago in the Kalmanoff group and I, I think I sent a copy of, of it to, to some of the some of the folks um, and I, I'm not going to quote Mr. Kalmanoff uh, when he gave his summary because it was laced with profanity but he said you just spent X amount of money to have me do a study and come up with exactly the same recommendations that the previous yep. three people who yep. did studies recommended yep. and you haven't done squat yep. to change anything yep. and the people who can can effectuate the change the most wear black robes right. and they didn't want to hear it right and I was sitting there right I agree Commissioner Boyle well what's been what's been said particularly Commissioner, Commissioner Borges and I agree with I wouldn't want my grandchildren to go through that system the way it is and and, and again I, I can only rely on you and I think the responsibility is with the judges that's where this all has to come from and um, you know another study isn't necessary I think we've got enough to to know where we should be going with this but um, it's very bothersome and I maybe we need to do something dramatic about the H uh, the health and human service people that show up or don't show up to change I mean it's a, that's we need to look at all of these functions that maybe frankly take over some of that so that we can control the people who are there and the judges are going to have to come up with uh, and I'm not, again I'm not an expert on it you are but I think we need to know uh, you know who or what can fix this if we are if we already know then let's get on it let's implement it well if we have how many district court judges do we have done 16. We have 16 district yeah. court judges, and we don't have this problem. Right. And we have, what, six right. juvenile court yeah. judges, and we have a terrible problem. Do the math. Yeah. Okay? Now, there's some new judges coming in and coming in. Maybe the new blood will make some changes. I've got my fingers crossed. I, I think they're good well, people. That's so true. I mean, we, you know, we don't have a problem in the district no. court with 16 different judges that we have right. to answer to with all of our people. Absolutely. We have a problem in juvenile court, it seems, when we only have six judges. Well, they just, I mean, you know, and observation, I mean, this cattle call thing up there, and the, but the subject matter, I mean, there's a cattle call on the civil side, but that's totally different, you know, with addictions and silly and things like that. But this is dealing with kids and places jammed, and it's, you know, it is a waste of time. So we need to have them mimic what the district court is doing, and progression calendars and all the rest of it has to be implemented. It really does. But again, I, I'm not going to try to impose in my ideas on this. I'm not actively engaged so much anymore. But I do rely on you to tell us what parts of these studies or whatever, and it's not going to be a quick fix necessarily, but what needs to be done and who can fix it. I think I have a good idea, but I need to have you tell us. And, and I came here for a budget yeah. uh, hearing and it's gone into a forum about juvenile court. And I think right. these are important questions to talk about, but we could spend a lot of, yeah. you know, it, it's different in juvenile court too because the case never goes away. There's not right. a completion usually period. It's a budget discussion because it's, it's costing us money. So it's a budget yeah. discussion. Right. Yeah. Commissioner Morgan. First, I want to thank Nicole for an excellent, excellent presentation. Appreciate your points. And now you went back and through it all. The other thing, uh, which maybe is a little self-serving, Commissioner Boyle, but I think having these discussions here yeah. on the budget and so on instead of up in 903, yeah is really helpful to the citizens and everyone to see and hear what we're trying to do and what we're going through and some of the challenges. So I thank you for your time. I'm sorry it took so long, but they were great points and really appreciate your participation so much and your points. Really appreciate it.
You go in, then I got to get Thanks. Well, I'm just going to tell you, you, know, it, some you, know, there, there's, there's you, Commissioner Rogers, and Commissioner Borgeson have really taken an interest in this area, and I, we appreciate that. So it's not that we're, and, but, but, and, and Commissioner Boyle, so I mean, there needs to be some things. We don't have control. Maybe it's, it's legislative right. or uh, judicial that probably has the biggest right. ability to make some sort of impact in that system. Uh, we can try, and, and we're all there because we really believe, as you do, uh, what's in the best interest of the child. That's That should be the bottom line here. Right. And that's the purpose of juvenile court. So yeah. anything we can do, we're willing to. And, and my closing point on that is I hear your argument for 16 versus 6, but the unfortunate thing is, you know, I don't know if the state's going to pay for 10 more. The state may pay for <laughs> one or two more, but... If it's 16 to 6 or 16 and 7 or 8, you may not ever get that ratio. Only thing I'm asking is can the players get together and find what works sure. for the 6 well, and I make think it all the work. The point is, is, as commissioner, is that we can, we can handle scheduling with 16 mm -hmm. judges, but how come, how come it's a problem when there's, we're, there's only six courtrooms to go to? That we're saying it, it should be yeah. something that's yeah, it should yeah. be easier. Not, not that we need more judges, right. but. How come it's so hard to schedule? Totally. Them? Well, to your point, that as of the meeting, the OIS meeting Thursday, unfortunately, you couldn't be there. That that was the commitment out the room. So that that meeting, that originally be was talked about the board, probation, relevant people from you all's office, and the court. We're looking at scheduling that. So that is going to happen here soon. So, okay. With that, thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you're still on this I item, so if you want to come to the mic, come to the mic, though, the, come to the mic. Oh, I mean. Doug Kagan, uh, 416 South 130th Street, rep I'm representing Nebraska Taxpayers for Freedom, and I have three short questions for the county attorney. Um, is there any more progress being made on consolidating the city and county attorney's office that would save taxpayers money? That's that, Doug, that's something that I've, I've tried to get accomplished, and it's a question of, I, I think there should be one prosecutorial entity uh, in the county. Most counties are that way. Uh, and it's an antiquated system. It used to be the municipal courts and and that's, that's gone. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I've talked to the city about that. Uh, I've, I've talked to a few folks about it. So I, 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 we could restart that process, but I didn't, haven't gotten anywhere yet. Okay. And um, would you save any money by discontinuing hiring interns for your office? Hiring interns? Yeah. Do you still hire interns or not? We have law clerks. Uh, is what we have, and, and we need them. They do they do running, they do uh, research, they do memos, that kind of thing. So it's they're they're I think we pay them minimum wage, and so we get a pretty good. They they get a lot more from us from the experience they gain uh, by learning about the law than than our cost factor is there. I see. And lastly, uh, would you save any money by taking testimony from expert witnesses long distance rather than bringing them here physically? Well. I mean, there, there's a the Constitution has a confrontation clause, and that the defendant has a right to confront the witnesses against them, and so we need to have that person come here to testify. But certainly, there are times when we can take depositions, and in lieu of, of testimony, maybe that we can do it that way, and we do do that. Uh, they take the public defender takes depositions, we take depositions, but as far as the trial, uh, the person usually usually has to be there because there's a confrontation clause issue. Okay. Time. Well, thank you very much. Sure. I, I had a few questions for the public defender, if I may. Please. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. And I, I have the paperwork from your uh, your budget here. And um, just real quick questions: your your parking. You are asking more for your parking fees. Is that because of more employees? Yes. Okay. And. and the price go up? Oh, we have a second county car. That's oh, why. That's okay. And uh, I think you answered that one. And uh, this may seem like a silly question, but you asked for more uh, furniture. Have you ever uh, uh, 
sought to go through uh, getting secondhand furniture from places? We get, we, get, we get it all the time from the county. Uh, we get hand-me-downs from the county frequently. Okay. And uh, are you still getting uh, revenue from the Sherwood Foundation? No. No, we aren't. Are we? No. And have you, do you still apply for it? or? We have on a couple of things, but we're, we, we don't wear the white hats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I get you. <laughs> yeah, I know you. <laughs> and I, had, I think I had one more question here, if I can find it. Um, Again, uh, can you can you save some travel uh, expenses by doing business by telephone long distance? Our travel expenses are minuscule. The okay. uh, the main the main travel expense that we have is the mileage going to and from the hospitals from the board of mental health hearings. They're held not in the courthouse. They're held at the various hospitals, and sometimes we can use the county car. Sometimes we can't. And if we can't, then the employee is entitled to the mileage. That's what the vast majority of that is. Uh, most of the time, uh, I mean, much of the chagrin of the lawyers in our office, we don't let, send them to Las Vegas for <laughs> seminars or, and that's where they have mm -hmm. them, you know, they don't have them in Bismarck, North Dakota, mm -hmm. they have them in Vegas and Miami, and, uh, I mean, that doesn't look too good, so. Okay. And, um, let's see, I covered that. Do you still have a, uh, an immigra immigration attorney to handle uh, things as interpreter, as an interpreter? He left, and we have uh, a new person that will be starting to replace him in, I think, the 1st of July. Is that legally required? Is it, what, is what legally required? Can Having I have an immigration attorney well, to the, handle the, that? First of all, the, the person that we use for immigration, there is a legal requirement to advise them of the possible immigration consequences. Every, every client, the first question we ask them is, in Spanish, don't it as you stay? In English, it's where were you born? And if, if the person was born out of the United States, then we have a constitutional obligation per the Supreme Court to advise them of the possible immigration ramifications, which is a very specialized field uh, for any conviction. And depending on their status, it will, it will make a difference. The other thing is, I have, how many Spanish-speaking lawyers do we have? Three? And this, the, the immigration one will be four. Uh, I would, I'll take more. Uh, and that saves a big amount of money. We don't have, that way when we go to the jail, we set, we assign the case to a Spanish-speaking attorney. We don't have to hire and pay for a, uh, a an interpreter to go with us. Okay. And the other thing is, the reason we hired an immigration, we got that originally from the Sherwood Foundation, is to get people out of the jail that were there on ice hold, sitting there for six, seven, eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at a cost of however much it is per day, uh, most of the folks don't know anything about what they should be doing. There's no right to counsel, but if you have an attorney, most of the time they, they'll say, I don't want to sit here in jail for eight more months, I'll go back home to Mexico. Now what they do after they go to Mexico, I can't control, Thank but you. I can control how long they sit in our jail by getting them into the immigration court quickly and getting the case disposed of. So that's a cost saving to to our county. Okay. Um, I asked you this question, I think, a couple years ago. Did you ever ask the Bar Association to provoke, provide attorneys pro bono to take care of some of your overload? No, I haven't, and I don't think that's anything I can do. Uh, there, there, the, uh, there, the, there's a conflict uh, group of lawyers, and they're going to get paid by whatever the statutory rate is. Um, I, don't, I don't have any control over that. That would be the Bar Association, and I don't think the Bar Association is going to um, endorse pro bono in criminal cases. That's all I have. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Any other Thanks, comment Tom. for the public on this related item, please? Wow. <clears throat> Commissioners. Morning. Good to see you. Everybody looks happy and well. You bet. Thank you. See, uh, I've got a couple things I want to ask about. Is uh, who's uh, who's running this railroad? Ha <laughs> ha You are. Well, you know, I've been sitting here for quite some time listening to a conversation back and forth, and uh, uh, this is for more money. 
Don needs more money. This other gentleman needs more money because we have some disconnects here, so we need more money. Well, gentlemen, I'll tell you what. You raised the rent on my house last year, and if you raise the rent on my house this year, I'm going to come looking for you. Okay? Yeah. You know what the rent was. Remember when we talked about that? Okay? Uh, we have to become more efficient. Now, I didn't hear one thing said by anybody about anything here. Don, I've known for a long time, seen him on TV from time to time. He doesn't remember me from years ago, but uh, I remember him because I see him on TV from time to time. We aren't doing a thing in our community here, the city of Omaha, in our county, in our state, to discourage this crime areas. I hear one person say, God, crime's down. Well, on the other hand, crime is up here. You know, I don't think anybody knows what's really going on here. But we, we're not doing anything to discourage people from staying out of the county jail and penitentiaries here. I have an idea I would like you guys to maybe kick around here. We have people sitting around all day watching TV, eating three squares a day, you know, leading a good life here. I would like to make a suggestion that we put some of these people in the Douglas County Jail to work. You know, I see the storm sewers in my neighborhood clogged up with leaves, sticks, and whatnot. Could we not take some of these people? I saw it in the public polls yesterday, I believe it was. A gentleman said, uh, Mark Douglas was his name. And we put these gentlemen in pink suits with a P on the back of the deal and go out and do some things in our community, pick up trash and whatnot. You know, they could clean these storm sewers here if they need somebody to supervise them. I'm retired, I can supervise them, but there'll be there'll be some ground rules laid down. We got a job to do, you don't wanna do it, take a hike here, we're out of here. But we, we're not taking full advantage of all the labor we have out here in our community. And I see Don and this other gentleman here, public defender, that's gotta be a circus, a circus, because it's over and over and over and over again. We're not doing anything to discourage what's happening here with our young people. Does anybody have any questions of me? Mr. Rogers? Yeah, I, you've been here several times, and I'm, I'm just saying this because my instinct as a chair says say it, and I'm not worried about you, but to anybody in the public, say you want to talk with the commissioner and don't say you're going to come looking for us because then the sheriff may have to look for you. <laughs> So that's just my that's just my chair instinct. Not nothing. I, you're not a threat, but I'm just saying you. Everybody knows you, so I'm just saying as counsel for anybody, just say you want to talk to us, and then you're not going to come looking for any elected official, Commissioner Boyle. Well, I, I understood what you meant, and uh, I've had some threats in my life, and I, others may have too. But I didn't take. I was kind of startled when you said that, but I know what you mean. You're going to come back and raise hell about your valuation, which is understandable. But let me just respond a little bit to what you brought up. Uh, the um, public defender and the county attorney are responding to our the needs of our community. Um, you know, I believe Mr. Klein uh, has, and Mr. Riley as well, but certainly Mr. Klein probably has around 35 to maybe 40 uh, cases involving first degree people charged with first degree murder. Uh, we have 30 or so, almost 40, in the Douglas County Correctional Facility. The governor has shifted to try to drive down the population of the penitentiary in Lincoln, has shifted, I believe through LB 605, uh, prisoners back home. Uh, that means they're coming here, which has put tremendous pressure and packed our jails. We can't, and because of a lot of reasons, we can't even accept uh, any more uh, uh, immigration people. And we're also, uh, there's some other difficulty. We're not making the revenue we were in the past because uh, we were under construction, but also because of the prisoners that are being sent back here to relieve the state prisons. So we have that on your property tax bill as well. And that comes from Governor, Governor Ricketts. That's where that lands, okay, at his doorstep. Uh, the other thing is um, we are, you heard the conversation go on here that was led by uh, the people involved here, uh, responding to difficulties in juvenile court. Uh, with the methods of the operations and the demands on the lawyers and it ultimately hurts the children is what I believe. So we're talking about trying to reform the system that will save money. We don't have a, court, a cattle call where you have 15 lawyers standing in the room all being paid uh, and only one 
progressing. The rest of them are not, and they're being called to their corporate It's a disaster. And as to putting people to work, uh, we have a contract with United Way that's very reasonable. I think it's about $50,000 a year. And we have, on any given day, uh, about 110 uh, nonprofits that accept uh, uh, individuals, uh, some even uh, uh, who are involved in criminal cases, but mostly misdemeanors, who go to work for the uh, nonprofit uh, and serve out their sentence instead of going to jail. It, it's great because they keep their jobs, they, all this sort of thing. People don't go on welfare, so it's, it is working. United Way does that. We have a contract with them. In addition to that, uh, I'm not sure who's in charge of the cleaning crews now. It used to be the mayor's office, but maybe it's us. I've lost track of that. But we do have people out cleaning around, but there's a lot of places they could clean up better. But there are those crews out there, those working crews, uh, and you see them with there's a, uh, someone supervising them as they clean up around Michael, town. So that's commendable. I'm we're doing so those happy things. to hear that. Well, we are doing what you, it's a good idea, and we're doing what, uh, and they're, you know, uh, that's the way they want to work off their sentence. So, but um, we are trying to do that thing. And, I, and also, the only thing I can say is that, the, you know, we have a, a good team operating here, and we've got very qualified people who are extremely fortunate, extremely fortunate to have uh, the kind of talent we do uh, in the prosecutor's office with Mr. Klein and in the public defender's office with Mr. Riley. It's, we are absolutely blessed to have those people running those offices with their philosophy. Well, if you gentlemen and ladies need any help, there's a lot of resources out here from retired people like myself that can maybe aid you guys in some of your problems. We do re we do rely on you. We, I, you know, we listen to what you have to say and we try to respond. So we, I, I know that we appreciate your being here. We really do. It helps. But you want to keep spending. Well, there are, we have to pay the bills. When people, when people commit crimes, we can't let them go. They have to be prosecuted. They have to be defended. So that's the price of living in a society. We could talk for hours about We could. Time. Any more questions? Commissioner Brooks. Not so much a question, but a comment that you bring up very good points, and there's more that's going on within the system and outside of the system that I would love to have time and a cup of coffee with you to let you know all of those because there are programs that we have and services that we have that are trying to keep individuals out of the system and then we are um, within our facilities we're starting discharge planning the minute they come in the door to try to keep them from not coming back in so um, I, I would love to sit down and talk to you more in depth about those well, programs and services. It's only going to be as good as we all make it working together. That's right really that's is. right absolutely. Yep. And the sooner we wake up and realize that the better off we're going to be. And I am a full believer that our retired folks have a lot to offer um, us as elected officials, but our system as a whole. So I would look forward to that conversation with you. I'm going to say one more thing, then I'm going to sit down. I'm going to donate a dollar, a dollar here. <laughs> that dollar is for my plastic bag that I'm going to use at the grocery store. We use plastic <laughs> bags, okay? Not our, yeah, have, that's the city. I Not our we job. to charge a buck a bag. Now, you guys are all have input to this. <laughs> no, we don't. You know? No, we don't. No, that's the city. Okay. Yeah, take Come your home. dollar back. Come back at two. Come back at two, yeah. Well, where I'm going with this is years ago, people took pride that's right. in their communities and their homes and whatnot. We have, for some reason, lost this over the last 20, 30, 40, mm -hmm. or 50 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's really sad because our young people are uh, not learning the skills that they should be learning here. Well, yes and no, and I, I know I don't want to drag this on, but here, here I'm going to get on my soapbox for one more time, and that is we have a lot of young people who are doing exceptional things in this county and in this state, but all we hear about are the bad things. So if we could for, I would say, a three to six month period I would love to be proven wrong. I would guarantee you that if we would switch focus and start putting the good news out at the first 10 minutes of the news on the front page of the papers, you would see a change in attitude in people because we, we are so drawn to this 
negative stuff because that's all we hear. I can't even watch the news at night. It, I can't sleep then. It, it's so awful the first 10 minutes because I know there are good things that are going on, but we don't hear about them. And I will guarantee you that if we did that, you would see a change in our young people's attitudes. Because how, do we, they, how do we make that happen? Well, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Okay. You know, you guys all got your binkies here with you today? Your binkies. Binky, yes. You, you won the $50,000 deal. I see people driving down the road in their cars and whatnot, going like this, you know. They're not paying any attention to the driving. Right. They're on their binkies. Right. And it's really sad. Yeah. 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 I could go yeah. on for an hour. I know. We'll, we'll talk. All right. Say again? Some people wear caps inside in public, too. Okay. <laughs> so, Jim, you got any more oh, budget-related <laughs> items? No, just watch the spending. If you need some help, not cash outlays, because we'll be touch. you're stretching my funds. Before you go, we know you, but can you state your name and sure. correct me? Jim Sazma, S-A-Z-A-M-A. -A. Thank you. Would you like anything else? Social no, security sir. number or data? Uh, Mike anything? would, but that's a different deal. <laughs> yeah, I was joking. Uh, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Good Anybody you. else? <laughs> yeah, take your dollar. Seeing none, uh, we got a request for a break so board members can uh, take care of some needs real quick. We're going to, it is uh, 27 Eleven twenty-seven. we're going to reconvene at 1135. I'd say to the public, it's just one of those days. It's budgets and there's items. When we reconvene, we'll go to the JAX budget. Then we'll go into the presentations. Yeah. Uh, so with that, we'll take a seven-minute break, and we will convene promptly at 1135. Can we get a uh, motion and a second? So move. I guess that would be helpful, wouldn't it? Right. Please vote. <laughs> Motion passes.
If any commissioner is in the back, we need to reconvene. Claire, we need four. Come on. Uh, Jack, uh, budget presentation. Yeah. Is there a motion to <laughs> reconvene? Well, wait a minute. We got to wait for the clerk now. Okay. Wait a minute. We got to wait for the clerk. Well, we got to wait for the clerk. By Commissioner Boyle, seconded by Commissioner Kraft. Mr. Clerk. Uh, we're ready. Yeah. Please vote. Motion passes. All voting yes. We'll now move on to the to item three. I know item four under uh, finance presentation of the Juvenile Assessment Center budget request for fiscal year 18, 19. Uh, Sean Kumpe. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today um, and to provide the budget request for the Douglas County Juvenile Assessment Center. You'll find in the packet that Dan was so kind to hand out um, the budget template for the Juvenile Assessment Center, the organizational chart, and the brief PowerPoint that I'll go over today. <coughs> I'll just dive right in and um, you'll see here our modified budget for the current fiscal year being $825,000. What page is that? Uh, it's two. two in the PowerPoint presentation. The target identified by finance is $835,000 and our requested budget this year is $803,000. It looks like we're under budget. However, I'm here today to ask the board for an increase in county general funds due to a reduction in our grant funding. And so that is listed below that we are asking for an increase of $235,140 over the current fiscal year in county general funds. That increase is um, due to the community-based aid funds covering only the first six months of the upcoming fiscal year. And after that, the Jack will not have those funds available. As evidenced this morning um, from the pres presentations that have already taken place, this board is well informed of the juvenile justice system reform efforts. Oftentimes those efforts are talking about youth and system efforts that are for kids who are deeply enmeshed in the system, who are court involved, who are detained. So I kind of want to back up to the purpose of the Juvenile Assessment Center and um, really talk about why youth come to the attention of the juvenile justice system. Law enforcement site youth, in their homes, in schools, on the streets. Schools write truancy referrals. And at times, parents ask for system assistance with their youth for ungovernable issues. Oftentimes, these issues regard mental health issues. The county attorney makes decisions on those reports. Every single report, whether it's law enforcement, school, or parent, are referred to our Douglas County Attorney's Office and per state statute in Nebraska, they have to make the filing decision for those. <coughs> they can choose to do nothing with that report to file in the juvenile court or to refer the youth for assessment and an opportunity for diversion. And this leads us to the purpose and function of the Juvenile Assessment Center. The Juvenile Assessment Center provides screening and assessment services to all those youth <coughs> and recommendations to the county attorney for further filing or processing decisions. The Douglas County Attorney's Office has the legal expertise <coughs> to handle 
all of those matters and the responsibility to handle those matters and the juvenile assessment center has the human or youth service expertise to provide recommendations our collaborative efforts seek to divert as many youth as possible from those formal court processing our philosophies include decreasing the likelihood of further offending or more serious offending by addressing situations of juvenile delinquency early on in the process we use validated risk assessment instruments in order to take bias out of the process our assessment results allow us to provide consistent and equitable response which is a key element of the juvenile justice system reform efforts research shows us that too little or too much intervention in a youth's life is harmful so we rely on matching the risks needs with interventions and we use our risk assessment and instruments and our screening and assessment process to do that and our assessment processes developed to meet youth needs are guided by evidence-based specialized training and research this is an absolute 1,000 foot view of the kids that we see at the juvenile assessment center just a brief snapshot today youth referred in the calendar year 2017 for legal violations 1,309 on truancy referrals the juvenile assessment center and the county attorney's office have a collaborative effort to see every single truancy referral and process those truancy referrals to determine if they are eligible for a diversionary process there were 1400 as you can see duly involved youth many of you know are youth who are already involved in the child welfare system and then do become involved in the delinquency system and then status requests or requests coming directly to the county attorney's office from parents requesting court intervention for their children <coughs> final diversion numbers from court processing for 2017 include 887 diversions and warning letters for those youth 167 truancy youth who did not progress to court processing and then 112 of the duly involved or crossover youth and status requests 40 youth did not go to court that does not mean the rest of the youth did those who were processed for either or those were did not end up going to court there are countless details I can provide you for each one of these kids to include how it was they came to the process of coming involved with the legal system what their risks and needs are what things help those youth what challenges those youth and families face and I'll be glad to provide any of those kind of details at a more appropriate and lengthier time today I would just like to summarize that the benefits of the Jack do include positive opportunities for all youth coming to the attention of the county attorney's office who may be assessed to get on a healthier life path we provide evidence-based recommendations for diversion decisions we do provide cost savings to the system and I would be glad to go into that deeper as well we assist to ensure that court resources can be used appropriately for those youth who need a higher level of supervision and or who are at a higher risk to reoffend. we provide information to the community to bolster community prevention efforts to help children not enter the system we participate and provide participate in and provide information to improve our juvenile justice system at all levels and finally the quality service that we do provide to the youth that come to the attention of the juvenile assessment center really does exhibit 
to young people, their families, and the community the values of this county in serving the citizens, both young and families. So with that, I would take any questions. Back on page uh, two, you talked about the uh, uh, community-based, uh, let's see, the community-based aid community team uh, <coughs> operation and youth success steering committee. There's a decision uh, to accept the county board appointed uh, recommendation to cut grant funding for the Jack. Uh, why was that recommendation made, if you know, and uh, what happened? What programs were ceased, or is there duplication? What about it? I'll explain that. Uh, Commission Boyle, there was a uh, recommendation brought to. Uh, make a tweak to the way the, the funds were done so uh, the group agreed that the commissioners would appoint one person right. uh, to sit on this screening committee uh, the committee recommended uh, cuts not only to the JAG but um, to home and I, not so much cuts to performance but the rationale was that the committee had been trying for years to put more money into the community and they the recommendation was that the county should put uh, split half of it to put more in and I had a conversation with everybody here kind of saying this is where it was and was there anybody at angst with it because if so then we needed to make the case in that room for it so people were fine with it going forward well, so just, yeah I'm just asking was yeah. was there were there some programs that you were doing that you no longer do I'm trying to get at why your budget's going up if you had these I know the grant funding was cut but you were doing what were you doing with the grant funds? Our our budget is only going up due to the funds the being cut, cut. Right, and those those cover personnel costs, mainly personnel costs. We okay. we we aren't changing our services. Okay, well, is where did those funds go? Are they just gone, or anybody else getting them? They they haven't went yet because the budget is for 19 so okay but I, I'm trying to drive at are, are those funds going to go to some other group yes okay to well some are, isn't that du are they gonna do the same things you're doing is this duplication that's no. the bottom line no, no. Okay, commissioner. okay what are you doing that they're not doing we're assessing youth who are coming to the attention of the Douglas County Attorney's Office right the programs who are receiving the funds are, are things like the Police Athletic League who are offering baseball and soccer in the community um, refugee advocate services I, I I do a disservice to try and name all of the different so that, that's where the money is going to go to to the prevention end and what are they doing there are they they're not doing the same thing that you are no they no they're not okay. Commissioner Boyle, I wouldn't I would make a hard correlation to say it's because money was taken from them and went there. Um, I think the, the money was given to the plan from two services in the plan that the county submitted. So some of the places that got funded were there. Other services got funded in regards to uh, alternatives to detention to keep them out. If you want the list, what we can do is provide. No, I'm just I'm just looking for duplication. Oh, okay. There's no duplication. Okay, well that's I'm, I I like I don't understand what the I mean if they're doing uh, playing soccer and things I, it's kind of odd because I've I've sat on a South Omaha grant committee and we gave them money. I mean they're getting money. Pace you're talking about? I mean they're getting money from a lot of sources and foundations. So anyway, I just I don't I don't get that. I guess let me go to page five where you talk about um, assessment processes developed to meet youth needs you talk about law violations truancy referrals duly involved the status requests is there any place in here that uh, trauma enters the picture young people that are uh, where is it on here it isn't listed on here that would be one of the points I would like to make if when I have a more detailed presentation for you yeah. trauma actually is a part of all of our assessments every one of our staff to include our administrative staff uh -huh. are trained in trauma-informed care and we're, we're doing those trainings at least twice a year. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Morrison. Sean, did you take a look at your budget and provide Joe, or I guess I'm gonna ask you if you have it, what your budget would look like if you don't get this um, funding? Um, and just so the board is aware that there is a um, committee right now taking a look at the jack to see whether or not 
uh, what they are providing should stay the same or should it look different and what would it be and all of that. So that's being looked at as we speak. But did you take a look and did you try, because I think that that's what we need to see, is if you didn't have this money, what would your budget look like? What would the services look like? Um, I'll, I mean, to me, we, we took a jump a few years ago with expanding this jack um, without any real, in my opinion, real thorough conversation and look at whether or not that's what we should do. Um, and now we've created this jacket. I'm not saying what we're doing is all wrong yet. I'm just saying that we need to now take that deep dive to see if what we're doing is really what we should be doing. Um, and uh, especially since now, um, and Commissioner Rogers and, and I have had this conversation, especially now because we're going to be looking at uh, general fund dollars, tax dollars to be funding um, the jack. And, and I think that that's the right thing to do is to look at this because I was one that kept pushing that LB561 dollars, community-based aid dollars should be getting out to the community, not funding governmental services. And so I'm okay with all of that. But what I need you to do is tell me what it would look like if you don't get these dollars. It's easy to come up and say I need it because everything stays the same, this is what we do, but what what is the other side of that? What's the flip side of that? And we need to know that. Can I go into that a little bit here, Commissioner? Um, is there if you don't, I mean, if you did it, I don't have any documentation that shows you did it. I didn't provide the documentation that it would be seven of the 13 staff would be cut um, it, because that money is almost all personnel costs. So that would mean seven staff cut. And um, I could go into just a little bit of the history of the JAC um, personnel. In, in 2003, when the JAC opened, there were nine staff. In 2006, we added our first bilingual specialist. That and when, what, what year was that? Um, 2006. Six, six. Mm -hmm. In 2013, we added another position and assessment specialist to meet the increased needs of youth being referred. That brought us to 11. And then in 2014, we increased two positions um, to meet the needs of, again, legal changes. So over the course of time, um, there were both legal changes in the way juveniles were processed and the truancy law, as well as an increased partnership with the Douglas County Attorney's Office, sending youth to be assessed who would formerly have been filed directly in court. So for instance, felonies used to be filed directly in court, and over the course of time now, felonies will come to the Juvenile Assessment Center for an opportunity to be diverted from the court process. So both of those things have been have been going along over the last several years and in, in increase to try and divert more youth brought on those more staff positions. So we've been at, at 13 staff since 2014. Well, and, and I guess I'll get on my soapbox a little bit on this one too, because prior to us doing this, and again, it was all triggered because of the truancy stuff to begin with, but prior to this, our youth didn't even enter the system, meaning entering into Jack. County attorney went to a provider, asked the provider to take these children. Those children were decided whether or not they should go there by the county attorney, and they went there. And, and the system worked, and that program was successful. It still is today, but with not getting referrals from us. And so now we've changed to where, and, and this is where I have a little bit of an angst, is that our OYS and our reform is to keep children out of the system, and we are now pulling, putting all of our children into the system to go through these um, screenings and services that the JAC provides. And in some cases, um, I think it's um, unnecessary. And again, philosophy difference, okay, fine, but again, I think that's where we need to really take a look at whether or not what we're doing, do we continue to do it the way we've done it? Um, especially when there's been um, great success um, from providers in the community that are able to handle these children. So um, I guess I think I, I would ask you to, again, whatever you just 
rattled off there to give us um, in what it would look like if we did not have those cuts and how that would affect what the benefits are of the jack, what the jack provides, how we do it. That's what I want to know. <laughs> I can I can forward that to you. And Commissioner, thank you for mentioning the the evaluation that the Jack is undergoing right now. It's a, a two year process, and I appreciate your participation on that. It's a pretty intense process of of stakeholders, um, and. Uh, Commissioner Borgeson is a part of that stakeholders group and really examining the purpose of the JAC and, and what should that function be moving forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Commissioner Kraft. Yeah, my fear is that if we don't fund you, will there be a, even a temporary spike in the number of juveniles being incarcerated? I would have to defer that to the county attorney Okay. Um, would would that be She's right? here, please go. Sure. Yeah, if, if you can answer that. <laughs> if they didn't have the personnel to appropriately manage and assess the cases that the county attorney's <coughs> office is referring to them, that could potentially if there's not a diversion opportunity lead to filing if juveniles are in front of the court. So we'd be increasing the cost of incarceration and the trauma of incarceration. Potentially. Potentially, yes. Case by case, depending <coughs> on the evidence presented to the judge on that case, it could potentially okay. be filed. That's what I assumed. I just wanted confirmation. Thank you. Okay, Sean, you have no other questions. Are there anybody else want to comment on the budget item? All right, good morning. Um, my name is Juliet Summers. Um, I live at 216 South 86th Street, Omaha, 68114. And I am here today to speak in support of the Juvenile Assessment Center's budgetary request. Um, when a young person gets into trouble, we need to respond carefully to ensure that he or she's held accountable in developmentally appropriate ways that are gonna promote community safety, while also setting the youth on a path to successful adulthood. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, I don't need to say this <laughs> to the board, uh, clearly you have a lot of information and expertise in this, but um, the form, involvement in the formal juvenile justice system, the court process, um, often unnecessarily drives low-risk youth deeper into the system and increases their chances of reoffending, increases the likelihood of the trauma of incarceration. Uh, diversion programs like the JAC allow youth who have committed crimes or status offenses to take responsibility for their actions, engage in rehabilitative services, and make reparations to the community without the expense and delay of court involvement. Um, I have a copy of my, of my written testimony that, that I can distribute so you have some of the, the data that I'll, I can offer to you. Um, I do want to say that um, I'm here particularly today because I was actually a member of that grant advisory team appointed by Commissioner Kavanaugh, I was, um, that recommended moving the budget for the JAC out of that community-based juvenile services aid fund and into, our recommendation would be for it to come into the county general fund. And I, I do not speak for other members of that group, I speak for myself um, here today, but I also would echo, this, echo the sentiments of a letter that we submitted at that time uh, to the Operation Youth Success Steering Committee and also to the board um, about that recommendation, explaining that recommendation. Um, and, and sort of the reasons were twofold. So, First, um, that that fund, that state fund, um, the hope and the intention was um, for that money to go to really early prevention. So as Commissioner Borgeson was um, discussing, to, to get that money out into the community where it can be true early, early, early preventive efforts to, to get kids into positive pro-social engagement, um, to uh, prevent criminal offending in the first place. I think as the gentleman earlier today w was thinking about as well. Um, so that money, um, the, advi the advisory committee really wanted to fund, to use that funds with the initial intent that the early prevention, what's gonna keep kids out of the system at all in the first place from coming to the attention of the county attorney uh, from committing crimes and then also 
um, for alternatives to detention, you know, once, if they have reached that point, to, to keep them safely in their home and community. So that was one big rationale for that recommendation. And the other was um, that a true philosophical um, belief that a juvenile diversion program is a necessary and important part, a function of local government. And as such, it really should be reliably funded through the budgetary process rather than having to apply year after year to a state grant fund that could disappear at the legislature's whim. You know, um, I also I do some, ad through my day job, <laughs> I do some advocacy at the state legislature on juvenile issues. Um, and I know that, ha um, you know, we're in a budgetary hole at the state level as well. Um, and every year we're a little worried that this fund that's meant to keep kids out of detention, out of the deeper end, could disappear. Um, so, um, oh, I didn't start my time. I don't know how long I've been talking at you. <laughs> you as long as, you know, you're reasonable. Okay, so I do want to say that um, it's really important to bear in mind here that um, there's a, a huge cost savings in addition to the community benefit that diversion offers. Um, so the Juvenile Justice Institute at UNO recently published a report on Nebraska's diversion programs, highlighting the link between successful completion of diversion and decreased recidivism rates. Um, JJI tracked young people across three years to determine whether they engaged in further criminal conduct after being referred to diversion programming. And they found that between 2012 and 2015, the Douglas County Juvenile Assessment Center had a 78% rate of successful completion of their diversion program. And of those 78%, nearly 70% did not have any law violations two to three years after completing the program. So there's a strong link between successful completion of diversion in Douglas County and um, lack of recidivism two to three years later. That's a really great statistic. Um, I'm not here to tell you that diversion or the jack is a panacea, um, but whether or not you attribute that rate of success to the jack's programming or to the fact that maybe those are the lower skews anyway, the dollars and cents of it is this, that through the jack, our county attorney is able to refer appropriate youth to be held accountable outside of the formal court process, which we just heard plenty of testimony about is messy and complicated and expensive. Um, and as a result, our county saves money and our families, our youth and our families are saved the stress and the time of unnecessary court involvement. Um, UNO has, um, has described cost savings of diversion by this way. Um, so they said that while each court appearance costs 300 to $400 per court appearance, a youth served through a juvenile diversion program costs only a few dollars a day. I know that um, an UNO has done a more in-depth assessment of the cost of court involvement and their cons very conservative number of a total from start to finish once you've come to court. Um, I think it's, it's 1465, 1475. Um, and that is extremely conservative, very low end of what the cost of one court case is from start to finish. Um, and so if you compare that, um, you know, the, the 2017 numbers of the successful completions at the Jack, those are kids who are going away who we know from the research are unlikely to recidivate two to three years into the future, at least, um, and compare that with the cost of, at a minimum, the estimate of costing um, almost $1,500 to go through the court process. It really reflects a substantial savings and, and a cost-effective way of doing this business. Um, and most importantly, uh, that estimate doesn't even account for longer-term savings the county experiences through reduced recidivism. So savings to the cost of individual victims of crimes that won't occur, savings on the costs of arrest, the cost of incarceration, um, the cost of future court involvement. So um, I've talked at you long enough. I'd be happy, uh, to, as I said, to distribute this to answer any questions you may have about um, my perspective on the work of that grant advisory committee. Um, and, and I just, I guess, want to close by saying, particularly this year, I think it is really important to do that evaluation and look at um, how the JAC is functioning and maybe ways that even fewer kids could be involved in that formal start of the process. Um, but I would love to see the opportunity for that money that this Grant Advisory Committee recommended flow out into the community to have the opportunity to see that money start to do its work in the community to get that in prevention so that fewer numbers start even coming to the JAC um, before 
you know, their staff would be cut or um, they would stop doing their work. Because my worry would be those cuts would result in more kids going into the, the court system. So, thank you for um, your time. Commissioner Boyle. Yes, if I could, I'd like to ask Commissioner Morgison a question because I think she knows the answer to this. Then I can. Uh, what does the state contribute to the Jack program? <laughs> Nothing. Mm -hmm. So, what I'd like to say to you is a very uh, community base aid. They contribute something. What do they contribute? The state money that yes, we sir. administer. <laughs> so, what, Sean, we what, what financially do you contribute? <coughs> Currently, in the current budget fiscal year, my things got moved. This is yours too, sorry about that. Currently this year we're receiving $487,674 grant dollars from our state legislative process. What's the source of the grant money, do you know? General fund state money. I'm sorry? General fund money from the state. General fund money from the state? Yeah. And so that, that goes toward your operations? That, is, that covers those seven personnel I mentioned earlier. I'm sorry, what's that? That covers those personnel I mentioned earlier, the seven personnel as well as our assessment okay. instrument itself, um, the drug testing, postage. Commissioner um, Boyle, if I can clarify, that, that's the money we're talking about cutting. It's, it's community-based aid funds which are um, issued by the Crime Commission. It's money that is allocated by the state in the legislative process. Crime Commission receives applications from jurisdictions, issues the money. So that money that she's talking about is the money that is on the table today. Okay, well, who, who's cutting that? We are? Well, that's the proposal to Why? the end. Why would we cut funds from the state that we don't get anything from them? I'm surprised. Let me, let me clarify. No. The, you want to be technical. The money comes from the state to the Crime Commission. The Crime Commission gives it to the county. The yeah. county administers it. We, it was a recommendation from the OA, and because of that money, the board doesn't control that money because the Crime Commission rules. Which is, board? This board? This board. The board just uh, agrees to accept it because the Crime Commission rules each county must submit a plan and, and they must put together an advisory group made up of prescriptive members. Right. That prescriptive body for us is the uh, Omaha Youth Success Group. There used to be a subsection of that group that reviewed the grant and recommended it. This year, uh, the board decided to appoint, each person had a rep, yeah. Commissioner Kavanaugh's rep. And each person had a rep and that board initially did the vet and made the recommendations to the OI Steering Committee. That's the money that they recommend didn't cut. And what they asked the board to do was to put more skin in the game on it, really much to take it out of soft money, uh, meaning grant money. So this is a conversation I had with the board before it happened because I told them this is the ramification. Do we want to absorb this? Because if not, we need to make the case. Everybody I talked to was fine. I made sure I talked to everybody. Oh, I'm not fine with it. Okay, you were fine then. No, I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> you, okay. I'm going to tell you, I talked, and because the fact was that when I was part of that initial vet group, they wanted to make those cuts. And I said, no, no, the board needs to sign off on that because of where it happened. So the, uh, what, what she's saying is right now they're technically in 18. 19 starts July 1 of this year. No. 18 starts July 1 of this year. That is the money that will fund them next year. And right now, they're only funded to go to December. All of that was personnel. Um, and so that's the, that's the history of it. Okay. Commissioner, may I, may I respond? Because I think I can I answer your question. Come on. Well, I, I just want to answer because here, here's where I have the beef is that th these are dollars that are coming from LB 561, which are the community based aid dollars. Mm -hmm. I look at that completely different than what the question was is, are there state dollars funding the JAC? Right. I say no, because this is a grant process, these, yeah. these community-based aid dollars. 
And so when when we have had this discussion at Operation Youth Success as to moving those grant dollars more out into the community, which then triggered the conversation as to if those go away from county departments and operations, then this board has to decide if we are going to use general fund tax dollars to fund them. So when Commissioner Rogers was going around and, and saying this is what the discussion was, the discussion from me anyway was, yes, I understand that and I can't say I'm 100% on board because I think we need to look at the jack. You can't just say that because one pot of money is going away, do we just continue to do what we're doing? Yeah. So we need to take a look at that and say, do we continue to fund the jack in the way that we have funded it before? Yeah. So it's still, it's, it's our dollars now, it's property tax dollars that are going to be funding it versus the grant dollars through the community-based aid. Well, where is the grant money going if it's not going to this? There's a whole list, and we'll have that sent back out. There's a whole list that the uh, community-based aid review team, where we appointed each person, they looked at all of the applications that came in uh -huh. from providers all over the, the county. county, and they decided where those should go. And then, and it tells you how much is getting this, how much is getting that. So we'll send that out to you. Um, as to where that money is going. Okay, is it going to be used for similar services or do you know? No, there's all different kinds of services. A lot geared towards prevention, some towards diversion, some towards aftercare. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a lot of different things. Not specific to providing what they're necessarily providing, um, but providing services that our youth um, need in the community. So that our youth need more in the community than what they're providing. Only you, those dollars. Well, that's what I mean. We're right. taking half a million dollars, giving it to somebody else. So it must. The only reason you do that, I would think, would be rational, is that that we're getting more bang for our buck with the other people than we are with the jack. No, the the emphasis was, is that when the community-based aid dollar law was passed and those dollars came down those dollars were supposed to go out to community providers. Uh -huh. If you look historically at our dollars, there was a small amount of the, of the dollars going to the community. Instead, they were being used to fund the JAC, the county attorney, uh, probation, uh, Operation Youth Success, internal stuff. So we said, time out, these dollars and the reason that these dollars came was so that we gave it to the community. Not necessarily has anything to do with the jack necessarily, but that it was those dollars were being used to fund the jack. So the question was, that's not really a community service. These dollars were supposed to go to community providers that are providing services for our youth. So that our services, county services, that's where our question and our debate has to go is, so do we use general fund dollars to make up that difference or do we not, is basically what the question is. Okay, well, I guess if I look at page four, it looks to me like they're doing things that should be funded and uh, also page five, but I, so I don't really see this. Um, I mean, the state is, uh, in spite of what's being said, is flush with money when they're cutting, when Governor Ricketts is cutting income taxes for the wealthy and for corporations. Uh, you know, the kids that were involved in that shooting in uh, Florida used a phrase, and I would like to use it here, but I'm not going to because there may it's be just some letters. children watching. It's it begins letters. with they B letters. and the second word is S. So anyway, I just, I don't really see a lot of, I just don't see the distinction between this. I, just, right, we, I think they're providing a service that, that I don't understand. I don't, well, I don't I'll show it. you the... Draw the, me some pictures. Yeah, I will. I Thanks. will. Yeah. Yeah. May, I, may I also sure. say... Sure. You still um, can. Commissioner, I think maybe you, you weren't present during uh, my part of my testimony. I was talking about the, just that decision from, or that recommendation from this Grant Advisory Committee. And I think the hope is, I really appreciate what Sean and, and the Jacks do, but I think the hope is that we can reach a day when fewer kids are being referred well, to yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Right. And that that, so right. rather than 
cutting state money from Douglas County, this is a different way of investing that state money to do that prevention work to keep kids from the front door of the system in the first That's place. That's a nice thing, except that we're being asked to make up the money from right. property tax dollars. At so, least for now. <laughs> well, not at least for now. I mean, it's it's a big deal because, you know, we when we lose grant funds and when we do it to ourselves, I mean, that's just really unusual. But when we lose grant money, I mean, that happens all the time with the sheriff's deputies, with Omaha police officers, all sorts of people. It's a great deal. We're going to have all this grant money by, you know, some benevolent person, and then bang, it's gone. And so we have to pick up millions, and the only way we do that is through property taxes. And I'm not a big fan of that at all. So, I mean, to me, this is going to be end up, in a, for my money, a cut for Jack. And I don't like to do it because I think they're doing good things. But if you have to sort it out that's that's what this leads to and of course the states contributed to this tremendously by cutting taxes there no this is like Kansas take a look at Kansas and uh, you know during the Reagan years I was there 22 percent interest I know what this all triggers trickle down is not trickle down it's money up that's what happens they just get more money and put it in their pocket it's awful so Commissioner Boyd just let me add I'll be happy to sit down with you too but let me just I don't I want to be fair. I'm fine with hitting the state, but I want to be fair when to hit them. Is that this is this is not uh, totally that on on this deal, um, and I think the um, like I said when I update everybody on what it is, the the history of that fund. And I'm gonna just I'll say this and I'll end it. Is that originally it started as a four hundred thousand dollar pot from the state that we use specifically all of it to um, fund the JAG and the home program. And as that fund grew recently over the last three to four years, it grew to 1.8 million. And other obligations came in and other things came. So this is, I, you know, I agree with you, this, those actions the state has, has taken. But um, it's not a direct argument for trickle down and other stuff like that. Um, you know, personally, I, you know, I've been saying for years they need to be off soft money, and it's, it's a fair to make the case to the public because the public needs to hear where it is. But the what this specific act that they're doing for us is the staff piece because there's other money in there that comes from the state that they use to pay for kids that can't afford the services, the assessment, and other stuff that comes with it. So your question is fair. I just want to make sure when when you make when you take a shot at the state, I want to join in. This may not be. Exactly a fair shot. Oh, Commissioner Rogers, the reason I responded that way was that Ms. Roberts, or excuse me, Ms. Summers, yep. made a comment uh, about the state uh, cutting funding and they're in a real budget crunch and everything else. Uh, well, they're not in a budget crunch if they're giving away money to millionaires and to corporations. That's my point. This is more of the same thing those kids talked about. It's BS is what it is. Fair. And they're, you know, they're creating a crisis so they can give money. The, I think the reason these programs and these grants are all cut is because they don't make campaign contributions. I'll leave it at that. Anything else you want to add? No. I don't see <laughs> any comment from the board. Thank you for your time. Any, <laughs> any uh, okay, no, no, we're open now. Anybody else want to comment on this item? Go ahead. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug Kagan again, Nebraska Taxpayers. I have three questions for the Jack people. Uh, first one is, um, do you have available the tracking mechanism to know what percentage of the kids successfully complete the department programs that's available to the public? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, and can we get a copy of that? We can provide that, yes. Okay. Uh, secondly, we've been talking about grants here. Is there any way you could apply for, I know various county departments apply for their own grants. Is there any way you could uh, accelerate your grant search to get uh, grant money to substitute for the grant money that was taken away? Currently, there are. You're close I, to the mic. You can't oh, get picked thank you. up. Is this on, is this one on? Yep. That's all. Okay, um, we actually ha have in the past had several grant sources, and all of those have gone away over time. So most of those were federal sources. This community-based aid is the only. Um, state source and we're currently receiving private sources to cover that evaluation process so that that doesn't come out of our budget okay and secondly um, do you still offer services and for non-english speakers yes we do okay and so you do you hire your own interpreters 
or do you have st staff that are bilingual? We have four staff that are bilingual. Okay. And those are, are do they just do bilingual work or other work also? Both. They, they see clients who speak Spanish and clients who speak English. And for all of the youth that we serve who speak other languages or whose families speak other languages, part of the community-based dollars go to an organization to provide interpreters and cultural ambassadors to help those families through the process. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Please. Rogers? Yes, sir. Still Jim Sazma, 9161 Charles. We're no. running from the county yet, like I told you. I'm anyway. still here. My question is, ma'am, uh, it looks like you're providing a pretty good service here, but has anybody ever looked at the what's causing these young people to get in these situations from the get-go? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Part of our part of the work of the Jack is always been looking at causation and how that we can help the community and specifically schools because that's where our youth are spending the majority of their time helping to prevent them from becoming arrested. Part of the system reform efforts. When Commissioner Rogers and others mention Operation Youth Success, we sit on almost all of those committees and take part in those committees trying to bolster prevention efforts so that so that kids don't become involved in the legal system. Um, I, I'm going to follow up with a question here. You know, we have a lot of young people in our society out here that uh, do good things. Uh, can, what are we doing for these kids, young kids, uh, in the area of good things? I was in a Boy Scouts. I was lucky to make the rank of Eagle Scout. And we had a lot of people in Boy Scouts. Uh, maybe what we ought to do is encourage some of our people to get in these organizations like the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatnot, give them more time to do those kinds of things and less time to get into trouble. Do we do anything in that arena? We do. We do. I appreciate that question. It's an excellent question. Part of when we are meeting with youth and families, we're identifying are they involved in any positive activities, and if they are not involved, we do try and help them get involved in positive activities. That is a key to youth being successful in the community. Yes, I've had the opportunity to attend some of the meetings out at the Learning Center, and I was not very impressed with what the Learning Center is doing for our young people today. What do you have to do with the Learning Center? Sir, we're not involved with the, the Learning Center. You're not? No. So you're over and above that then? I don't know the connection. I, 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 You're not familiar with the Learning Center? I will have to learn about that. Okay. That's uh, all I have. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Seeing none, thank you, Sean. Thank, thank you for your time, Commissioners. You. We'll now go into presentations and item A, uh, our cash bond bills unconstitutional. Commissioner Kraft, you want to intro this? Yes. Um, this is an acquaintance of mine, <laughs> David Herzog. Uh, he's pretty well known throughout the community. David's been an attorney. For, I'm going to let you do a little bit of a bio of yourself, if you would, please. But he's going to talk about cash bells and how, well, I'll, he will explain it much better than I ever could. So, David? My name is David Herzog. I've been a lawyer since... 1962, and these days it sounds like 1862. <laughs> I'm a former deputy county attorney. Don Klein talked about his boss, Pinky Knowles. I work for Pinky Knowles, one of the greatest trial lawyers I've ever experienced. I am a founding member of the Nebraska Criminal Defense Attorneys Association, and I am here because I read the law morning, noon, the night, and even in the, in the restroom. And I came across a series of federal court cases where the cash bail bond system is being attacked as unconstitutional. So what the hell am I talking about? What I'm talking about is 
that the Constitution of the United States and the state of Nebraska provides for bail. Bail is a cash deposit that arrestees pay to obtain their freedom. There are some arrestees who are released on their own recognizance, very few. Some have to deposit monies to obtain their freedom. The constitutional attack is under the Equal Protection Clause of the federal constitution and our state constitution, which means that a wealthy person, a person with monies, can buy their freedom before trial, but a poor person sits in jail. What knocked my socks off this morning was that there was a quote about the prison population that there are 900, there are 900 citizens sitting at 710 South 17th Street waiting for their days in court because they aren't admitted to bail. Now, some of those people should not be admitted to bail. What I am here to advocate is a letter that I sent to Commissioner Kraft detailing what has occurred in federal court, particularly in Houston and in Colorado, and I think in other, other districts where the bail bond system that is based on cash has been declared unconstitutional. So what's the remedy? The remedy is the federal system. The federal system does not allow for cash bail. Either the judicial magistrate deciding whether or not the person is to be released or kept in confine decides on the basis of harm to the community, harm to the person, harm to citizen. So it's a go or no go system. Money is out. The problem is, is that there's a political dimension to this. In Douglas County, if I have a bail that is $1,000, that's 10% of $10,000. Guess who keeps 10% of the 10%? You do. So there is a process by which you may be financially shooting yourself in the foot if you go for the federal system. I think Commissioner Kraft has circulated a copy of my letter detailing the federal litigation. And I'm not here to tell you that you're going to get sued by David L. Herzog. No, I'm not going to do it because this is state legislation. That's the only forum that's going to cure the problem. What I'm suggesting that the County Board of Douglas County do is to support the revision of our bail bond statute so that it more approximate the federal system, which is more humane. But what's the big deal? about the, the 900 people that are sitting in jail, because that reduces your costs. Hello, it reduces your costs. Should I say that the third time? No, it reduces, <laughs> okay. Uh, I recommend that this board go on record to support the adoption of the federal system. I sent uh, Commissioner Kraft a copy of the federal rules that detail how the go, no-go system works. Part of the no-go system or the go system when the person is released, they're released to pre-truck officers who are like probation officers and they're monitored so that they're employed, so they behave, so that their activities ensure that they appear for future court of proceedings. One of the things I was just alarmed with, and I'm going to go off script here, I'm going to suggest that you members of the county board read a book published by and authored by Dr. John DiUlio, D-I, capital L-U-L-I-O, Jr. He wrote a book. I think he's a Princeton criminologist, and his thesis was the youth predator. This is a child who has no connection except the TV to video games, spurn school, religion means nothing, the morals 
of the Stop and Go Lights, John DiIulio, the Youth Predator, a very highly controversial uh, publication. But what you're doing here is you're reacting to the crime, the delinquency, and the difficulties that are costing us taxpayers an arm and a leg. John DiIulio has a theory as to why they're getting into the systems in the first place. Ab initio, from the starts, Jim likes that. So does Mike. I learned something in law school. Anyhow, Dr. Fox, Fox Law, has been also given a copy of the federal rules and regulations to steer us away from the cash bail bond system, and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. You can't do it, because this requires state uh, state uh, legislation to cure. There was a recent amendment to our bail bond statute where a judge has to decide whether or not the detainee or the or the accused defendant has the ability to pay for a bail, has the ability to pay for it. That just flies by like smoke. It has no moment. Let me give you a little example of where I come from. When I worked for Pinky Knowles, Donald Knowles, a blessed memory, my office had six lawyers in it. Of course, the city stopped at 72nd Street. <coughs> Now, Don Klein and the public defender have over 50 lawyers in their office. 50. Why? It's a function of population. It's how large we have become. We're no longer, what's that cartoon in the New Yorker of a New Yorker's view of the United States? It starts at the Statue of Liberty, Philadelphia. Chicago, Las Vegas, and Hawaiian Islands. The we're just somewhere down there. Well, we're no longer down there. This is a wonderful town. I love it. I've been practicing law here for a long time, and I want to continue to do so. My recommendation is look at the letter I sent to Commissioner Kraft detailing the vulnerability of our cash bail bonds. Any questions? Thank, Sir, thank you, you, David. Have, you have a slew of fans. We're yeah. going to start with uh, Commissioner Kraft. And, and I've shared, slew of comments. I'm, I'm not sure if you sent me three or four letters plus that other one, mm -hmm. but I've shared every one of them with all of the commissioners. The last one I shared in a paper copy instead of a digital copy. And I think to a man we may agree with you, because at $93 a day for incarceration, 900 people being incarcerated pre-adjudication or pre-trial, that's uh, about $83,000, $84,000 a day. A day. That is a lot of our tax dollars. So if we could cut that in half by monitoring in other ways, I think we could cut it way more than half. But let's just look at that and, and go with what we can. Uh, and, and for the public's information, David is one of the brightest people I've ever met. I, um, I, I'm not saying that. He, he has a memory that is fantastic. He's represented many people um, in defense. And one of the people I admire most in the law profession. Thank you. So I'm going to let questions go from other commissioners. Mr. Terzog, I said that tongue in cheek, a slew of fans. What I meant is you, got a slew, you have a slew of interest here. So <laughs> lined up. Uh, Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner Kavanaugh, Commissioner Duda, Commissioner Borgeson. Um, David, I, 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 first of all, your, your letters are very thoughtful, and I read each one of them uh, several times. Thank you. And I really, they're very, very, they're just incredible, very well written. Doesn't surprise me, but they're very well written. And I do want to acknowledge the uh, other half of the family, Julie Dunn, who just came in the back, too, who's also a practicing lawyer, and she's monitoring what you're saying, David, so I know how that goes. I, I, I want to ask, you know, the purpose of bail... You can't get by with anything, can you? Correct. No. 
The purpose of bail uh, to me is supposed to be uh, to avoid a flight risk, you know, to set some kind of a reasonable bail. And you look back, I don't mean to bring up a lot of pain, but you look at the incident where the woman was killed on Q Street by someone who was uh, not a citizen. And uh, the judge followed what at the time was procedure, but you just saw another case a couple of weeks ago where the bail was set at $2 million. Um, uh, so, and the fellow, the uh, one that was several months ago, uh, well, maybe a year and a half ago now, uh, who killed the young lady, uh, he left the country and no one could find him. Right. So, um, when you say that the federal system is released, uh, you know, how would that prevent someone who is of a mind to flee, particularly when they're not a citizen? How does this, how does that fit? What happens? Well, the first example you're talking about is a monumental screw-up because there was a police officer in that motor vehicle homicide case that called the INS three times wow. to find out what status. that immigration status was. And if, if the INS had answered the telephone, yep. that fellow would never have done what right. he did. Right. So the point is, is that the scrutiny that a detainee potentially would go through to determine if he's a go, keep or no keep, is exactly what you're, it would ferret out exactly that. These million dollar bails and bonds, that's like asking a citizen to pay the national debt. Yeah. I mean, it's, now the problem is, is that under Nebraska law, for the purpose, because of the presumption of innocence, every citizen has the presumption of innocence. If a person came before a judge, under that presumption, everybody would go. But our Supreme Court has ruled that a citizen charged may be regarded by a judge as having committed that offense for the purpose of setting conditions of release. Right. Now that's the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution reflected in our Nebraska Constitution. And that's the way it's been. But most recently, because of the attack on the cash system, which penalizes persons who are poor and impoverished penalizes them, whereas the person with funds can buy their liberty. That's the point. Thank you. Commissioner Kavanaugh. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Counselor, it's uh, a pleasure to have you here today. I've had I love you too, and I'll vote for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I've had a, uh, uh, a great education uh, listening to you. I've appeared uh, simultaneously with you in court many times and uh, learned a lot. I served on the criminal defense attorneys uh, board with you for years and I learned a lot there as well. You make a cogent uh, point and that is uh, that as Commissioner Boyle indicated, the point of bond is to make sure you show up in court. That's it. Not That's to punish you. Not good to, behavior also. Yeah, but, but it's not a punitive uh, matter. Not supposed to be, but it is. And we are unfortunately in a situation where the numbers that, that you and Commissioner Kraft indicated uh, relative to if we have 900 people at 90 bucks a night, uh, $84,000, that adds up real quick. And so, you know, it's not only just that we follow the law, but it's also good economics that we follow the law. Your letters are. Uh, uh, cogent and, and, and well uh, written from a legal point of view, they make complete sense. Uh, I'm also taken by your comment that as commissioners, we don't have a lot of control over, over this. Correct. Uh, but uh, we're not the only people listening to you talk here today. And so as uh, an active uh, citizen in our community, you're in the public forum now. You're in the agora and uh, hopefully the public is watching and, and listening, and, and we welcome that type of civic engagement. Thank Finally, you. I'm, I must add um, that um, you are an occasional uh, churchgoer at our parish, and uh, your wife invariably has the best Easter bonnet of, of anybody there. So, Julie, uh, welcome again. So, well, she you. always finds a, a pew in the church that doesn't have a kneeler because I'm not Catholic, I'm Jewish. <laughs> She's Catholic, and so she finds me the appropriate position. But, Very uh, ecumenical. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It's a great parish. Thanks for, for your contribution. Commissioner Duda. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. This makes too much sense to ever happen. Um, what, what you say makes eminent sense and, and would be such a positive step forward for not just Douglas County, but if it impacts us, it's going to impact every county in the state. Uh, the, the, the cost savings and the effectiveness of, of what you suggest are almost unfathomable. Um, but the quickest way to make enemies is to try to change something. This is too drastic of a change, I think, for us to ever see in our lifetime. But man, I love it. I love what you are saying, and I would be thrilled if this board uh, could somehow try to make that happen. It's going to require legislation. I have sent the similar address to our uh, Douglas County uh, state uh, representatives in our one horse opera, the unicameral. And uh, hopefully they too will see the wisdom because it does impact you. It does impact Douglas County taxpayers. And make no mistake, the system that the feds use also requires staff. So, I mean, give you a great idea on the one hand, but there's a cost factor. On the other hand, you have to be beware of. And then there's the political process of the 10% from the 10%, which Jim knows about, uh, that uh, makes, uh, and Mike knows about, that uh, may be something that has to be coped with. But I'm grateful for the reception, and thank you. Uh, John DiUlio Jr. <laughs> if you all don't read it, you're going to miss a wonderful opportunity to learn why we're getting the juvenile court caseloads, why we're getting the craziness that goes on in county court. Do you know that the county court last year handed 200,000 pieces of business? <laughs> 200,000, and I have to wait in that courtroom. You know who was missing at this rostrum? Here's the legislative side of constitutional government. Don Klein is the representative of the executive. Where was the judicial department? And there is a remedy, by the way. Years ago, I'm in county and district court over a Custody matter one of those ugly divorce cases that just never seemed to go away. And the judge said, I'm going to appoint a guardian ad litem to represent the children in this divorce case. And then he said, by the way, I was told by the county board that I don't, that I am to tell you that no longer is the county board going to pay for the guardian's ad litem. Now I want mommy and daddy to deposit a fund of money to pay for to save because the county board has asked me not to saddle the county board with those expenses so i'm saying to you folks talk to the judicial department they'll listen thank you well sir you got unless you're just going to leave which is your prerogative you got three more questions okay okay commissioner borgson uh, thank you for being here. Um, the 10, I, not necessarily a question for you, but when you made the comment about the 10%, do we keep that or do the, does the court keep that? You keep it. I guess I, I want a clarification on that. Um, and then can you spell the author's name again? <laughs> D -I John D.I. capital L-U-L-I-O Jr. Did you Google it? Okay. You'll knock your socks off. Okay. And then um, I believe that even though, again, we, we sit in a precarious position where we, all this comes to us, but we don't necessarily, we're not the driver of it necessarily. But to me, yes, we can inject ourselves, and that's through the legislative process. And so, again, we could come up with being the catalyst for that discussion. Um, to say we want to take a look at this and we want to change the legislation uh, if we so desire. So again, we may not have control of it, but we have control of what our legislative package is. And if we want to, we can say 
let's start that discussion with our senators and see whether or not there's, uh, there's the will to do to make pathway. some changes. That's the pathway. And we then have lobbyists and the group of senators from this district. I think you have the pathway. And so just again, I want to make sure I understood what you said. So if there's no bail system, the judges, the, the federal system where they either decide you just stay or you go. It's not, it, you, there's not a dollar amount, the bond it's the, is not attached to that decision. It's Correct. just you, you, you're there or you're not there. I'm going to bite my tongue. Well, we, wait, wait, before you do that, uh, during this conversation, could you talk about the third party custodian on the federal system? Yeah. When it's appropriate. Thank you. Right. There is a mechanism in the federal matrix where a person who is charged to be detained, one of the options for the judge is to assign the accused defendant to a third party custodian. Could be a minister, could be a priest, could be a rabbi, could be someone who is responsible to the judge for the good conduct and behavior of the accused. That's Our retirees. <laughs> yeah, well. I'll bite my tongue. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm done. Thank okay. you. I, I Mr. Herzog, uh, I'm going to ask the board to trust me here. Uh, I'm going to, you're welcome to come back anytime. Matter of fact, I'm looking to talk to you, but for um, reasons, I'm going to cut it. Just let me say that we have brought it up. The, Dr. Foxall and his staff are working on some options with the court and us to bring a pretrial grid and have some options to get there. You're welcome to come back, but uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Yeah. And, and I just, you can sit down or go back or whatever. I just want to thank you for coming. The reason I asked David to come is to create public awareness. We're all aware of this because of the letters you've sent, but I want public attention paid to this. Uh, over the course of a year, we could be spending close to six, if it's half of it, the savings would be $16 million a year. Wow. That's at, that's at $93 a day for 900 people and then cutting it in half. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much. And yes, we will put on that legislative agenda. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You, thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Uh, we'll move on to item B in presentations. Uh, resolution directing the county board to make an offer to purchase a property from Marcy Mason LLC in the amount of $900,000. Mr. Bloomingdale. Uh, you do. So good morning, it's Patrick Bloomingdale, Douglas County Administrator. So I was asked to give just a quick background of the proposed project as it relates to what's on the agenda today, which is solely the purchase of properties at the corner of 18th and Harney. So I'm going to show you the map here first. What we're talking about, and you see the map on the overhead, is on the top right, you'll see the OHA building and in the bottom left, along with the OHA building, is the OHA parking lot. So that amount that the county board has asked to approve the amount of $2.75 million to put that offer on the table to purchase the OHA property. The next property we're talking about would be at the bottom right, which is the Marcy Mason building, which is the former Army Corps of Engineers building. And the uh, resolution to before you today is to approve the ability of the county to make an offer of $900,000 for the purchase of that property. The county, as you see in between, there's another building that would be involved in this proposed project, which is the Douglas County building, Douglas County owned building, which is currently operated by, or houses.com. On to the next page. So this process really started with the discussion of the need for juvenile court space. The sixth floor of the juvenile court, as you all know for years, has been an issue of discussion that is just not 
laid out appropriately and it's not big enough. And it's been exacerbated by the need for an additional judge and possibly more judges going you know, into the future. So um, along with the discussion internally that the county board has had, the building commission authored a study. They hired uh, a consultant, DLR, and the Karen Chin group to conduct a space study for the juvenile court, but also a juvenile assessment needs study. And one of the uh, findings that they had, you can see here, is that the size and configuration of the floor, the sixth floor of the juvenile court, inhibits the ability to develop a secure and functional juvenile court layout based on numerous functional problems that hamper the courts from effectively and efficiently operating. That was the study that was just recently published just this past January. Also, that study finds that the juvenile courtrooms in all areas of the sixth floor of the courthouse are inadequate. They're crowded, non-trauma uh, informed, not non-trauma responsive, and do not reflect best practices for court facilities. Another aspect of this, as I just previously mentioned, was the bill that was passed in 2017 to add a sixth judge in the juvenile court. And there's a very real possibility, I think, that there may be a seventh judge coming as early as next year. To exacerbate the space problem, there was a bill which looks like it's not going to be an issue this year, but will definitely be back next year before the legislature, I think, is a proposal to add a 17th district court judge. And where do you put them? The logical place would be sixth floor by revamping, completely revamping sixth floor for district court use. Another aspect that the DLR study focused on was the current youth center at 42nd and Woolworth. And the study found that the current detention center does not reflect best practice in its modern, secure uh, residential facility design, which means that if we would be building it today, it would look very little or nothing like it looks now, because it was built in the mid-90s at a time where not as much thought was given to the fact that we have razor wire on the fences and we have cells, we have a jail-like atmosphere for our youth. It's just not best practice. So the study finds that a modern youth detention center would have a non-institutional environment, like you currently see at the youth center and like you see at the adult facility, access to things like natural light and fresh air and movement throughout the day, housing units that have natural light and non-cell appearance, and direct a direct secure connection to the juvenile court, which is what we're talking about here. A separate building for the youth center, but would have a separate secure connection to the juvenile court. So collating, uh, co-locating the youth center with the juvenile court and, and really the entire juvenile justice center, which would house the juvenile court and the related assistance programs and agencies would be best practice. It would be a separate building and entrances. It would have a positive cost and impact of transportation of youth. So that would be reduced potentially significantly because they would not have to be transported down from 42nd Street. And there would be an improved access to interrelated programs and services for youth and their families, such as the JAC and other programs that are being proposed to house in the new Justice Center. So the tentative goals of what is being discussed, and nothing is in stone now at this point. It's all tentative, but this is what's been discussed, would be a multi-story justice center on the, the plot where OHA currently sits and the, the counties.com building currently sits. They would house eight juvenile judges and courtrooms because there probably is going to be eight at some point in the not too distant future. And the juvenile court related functions like juvenile court administration, the clerks that are assigned to the juvenile court functions. We would propose to move juvenile probation from the Key Keyline building where we pay rent, co-locate them in the juvenile justice in the justice center. But we would also put the entire entirety of the county attorney's office and public defender's office in that building. And what that it would accomplish two things. One, the juvenile divisions of those departments would be and should be really co-located where all of those other juvenile ju justice functions take place. But by moving the rest of those operations, the adult functions of the public defender and county attorney, it frees up space in the courthouse where, as we talked about the district court, there's a definite need 
for space immediately, really, really immediately. So it would also house um, shared use and meeting spaces for associated allied agencies and services. We talked about the JAC, juvenile probation, other um, alternatives, and a public lobby with building support all in one multi-story building. And then it would also have, as I mentioned, a youth center facility in an adjoining secure location. So to kind of summarize, best practices would be the co-location of the juvenile courts and supporting agencies with the interrelated juvenile services, departments, and other agencies um, with juvenile courts and the youth center. This provides an opportunity to add and improve responsive education, recreation, and visiting programs. And, and really what this does is this is an opportunity for the county board to take a big bite out of this juvenile justice reform effort. I mean, we've been at it for so long with varying degrees of results, but now you're taking you know, a, a really crisis with the space needs and you're using this as an opportunity to not only correct those space needs, but really have some positive progress towards true juvenile justice reform. So what the first step is, is where are you gonna put it? Everybody knows by now that we looked at MUD, those, those talks were not fruitful, but I say, it, I call it serendipitous because it made us look at the other spot across 18th Street. And to me, that's a much better location. It provides more room, more opportunities to do the things that you really wanna do. And there's a list there of, of the kind of things that would, would really be a benefit as far as this, regarding this project. And then of course we get to what we're really here today to take action on is the OHA offer and the Marcy Mason offer. So I will attempt to answer any questions my hope is that some of the commissioners will help me answer those questions as well. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, as you know, I've been calling for a public hearing on this enormous project for a long time, so I'm delighted that today we're seeing the light of day. Thanks for bringing it out. Um, relative to what we're talking about, and you know, you you referenced it earlier in the uh, Chen study, which is about the only document that's had uh, a lot of numbers relative to this. This is a hundred million dollar plus operation that you are being asked to take the first step on. Let me say that again. This is a hundred million dollar plus operation uh, that you're being asked to take the first step on today. That said, <coughs> we have $3.65 million, plus or minus, as the down payment on a $100 million plus largest capital construction operation that I'm aware of the county having in some time. This is the first public hearing that we've had on this. We would probably, in the course of doing something like this, be wise <clears throat> to look at what's the appropriate process for spending first 3.645 million plus of the taxpayers' money on property that's not been publicly discussed, no public hearings other than this one, and no committee hearings like we had on the uh, public safety bond a couple years ago. As you'll recall, when we had a $45 million bond uh, on the table, months of committee hearings uh, with valuable input from the community, including Nebraska taxpayers for freedom, um, and the Committee of Citizens for Safer Douglas County and public uh, entities and, and private entities and uh, everybody who was interested uh, were called upon on multiple occasions over months for public input um, regarding the bond. It was successfully tailored and passed. And this is a $100 million compared to a $45 million uh, taxpayer money uh, program and I don't think that we should rush this deal through on one presentation um, or public hearing. I think that this is a good start and I agree with you that you know we need to take first steps uh, but first steps don't mean that you go from 
here's what we're thinking about doing and let's make an offer. So I think that what we need to talk about today, in addition to the $3.65 million number for various properties, is the finan financing mechanism, not only for that initial down payment, but for the entire $100 million. Make no mistake, if you authorize $3.65 million to acquire these properties, maybe at that number, maybe at some other number, you're going to acquire these properties. Then you have them. Then you have them. And the rest of this will be the rest of the hundred-plus million dollar project. Um, so I think a number of public discussions relative to that, whether we need to do it, <clears throat> do it here or possibly some other location, we've already looked not publicly, uh, but we have looked at the MUD location, and we spent quite a bit of money um, studying this. Maybe you're aware of it, maybe you're not, uh, but the county has spent nearly $100,000 studying various real estate pre-designed services for a juvenile justice facility, including 22500 approved October 3rd, 2017, with HDR and MUD, We've never gotten that study. I talked to the representatives of MUD yesterday, and they never received a study. And 60000 plus was paid for uh, the DLR CHIN study, which, as Patrick has indicated, is public av publicly available and contains the hundred-plus million dollar budget figure that I would strongly urge you to look at. Um, what we want to do, I think, is when we purchase buildings, these two buildings or, or any other, is determine um, valuation. And just, you know, in looking at this, I'm no uh, public property or private property expert for that matter. I own some property, but um, what we have here are, are properties that, as far as we know, um, their valuation is far below um, what we're offering. Um, we're offering $900,000 uh, for a building that last sold for $470,000 in 2013, is vacant, and is valued for tax purposes at $457,000. So basically twice what it's valued for and what it recently sold for. The other building, $2.750 million for the OHA building um, across the street, is a little more difficult to determine because it's been off the tax rolls, not only for OHA, but prior to that as, uh, I believe, the United Way not-for-profit headquarters. Um, but, and I wish there was somebody here from the assessor's office, and this is another reason why we, we need to have additional hearings on this. It appears that the ground belongs to Douglas County, which would mean that the building sits on leased ground. I'm not sure. I'm going by the Douglas County Assessor's uh, information, but in looking at that, I wish somebody from the Assessor's Office was here to explain that. I mean, if we're talking about a, a building that sits on property that it doesn't own, Maybe wait for that lease to go by before you offer them um, the better part of uh, uh, 2.5 million, uh, 2.75 million dollars. Um, what I would indicate is that when we purchase these two buildings uh, listed on the agenda, it states in the documents. Uh, that they are budgeted for, and I don't know where we find that in the budget. I've heard anecdotally that we're going to take money from the inheritance tax fund, which is not budgeted for anything, and apply it to the purchase price of these properties. Um, we just had discussions for the last couple hours or more about a few hundred thousand dollars, as if it was the end of the world, and we didn't know where we were going to get it, and we're in a budget crisis, et cetera, et cetera. 
but now we have three point six five million dollars and boom we have budgeted money floating around that can take care of that you know these things deserve serious discussion by people who are serious about the spending of tax dollars that is for the current year budgeted for the current year there's nothing budgeted for the out years so if you get these buildings presumably you're not going to do what they're doing now I think that this report doesn't really go into it but you're probably going to knock them down and demolition means that there is something after that demolition and what's after that demolition is the construction of the balance of that over 100 million dollar facility um, there is I think an allegation here that there is evidence that improving courtrooms and judges offices leads to improving juvenile justice systems um, I practice law for a lot of years I've talked to juvenile court judges about this specific project they're not convinced that that's the case they're the persons on the front line of dispensing juvenile justice um, they also indicate they're in no rush to move uh, with the remodeling such as it is uh, there is no rush to move we have a new judge um, Mr. B <clears throat> Bloomingdale indicated that there's the possibility of future legislatures creating future judges that's true the hardest thing for the legislature to do in the 30 years that I've been going down there and watching it is creating new judges and they just created one for us we're not going to get another one anytime soon and if you studied this session under this governor he's not interested in spending any more money anywhere for anything let alone judges in Omaha Nebraska so what we have is a situation where the juvenile courts although it's not perfect are okay where they are and I've talked to the county attorneys and the public defenders and they're not happy where where they are they've never been happy with where they are I used to work in those offices I understand why but they work they work uh, I talked to and you all heard on record here Mr. Alexander the director of the Youth Center talk about the Youth Center which is about half as full as it was in the recent past and it's not perfect but it's on a huge campus that we own and it works and when I asked him do you need to move now is there a, a need to move now programmatically population wise whatever he said no there is not so the main stakeholders in this hundred million dollar plus project that's being proposed are in no hurry to move and all I'm saying is well if they're not in any hurry there is no hurry why don't we take our time before we jump over the wall of a hundred million dollar plus expenditures because that's going to involve a property tax increase I will guarantee you it will involve a property tax increase let me say it again this will involve a property tax increase I'm not in favor of that um, if we go down the list of the properties themselves <clears throat> we've got the property that we're offering 900,000 for that in 2018 is on the tax rolls for 470 uh, we've got another property that we're offering 2.75 million dollars for how we got to 2.75 million dollars I don't know where OHA goes from there I don't know um, OHA is not going to disappear they're going to move somewhere it would be good to know where that is um, it would be good to know what comparables we're using for the 2.75 million dollar figure the Building Commission just awarded a contract for a new juvenile courtroom project in the amount of four hundred and fifty eight thousand six hundred and forty dollars why are we spending half a million dollars on renovation if we're not going to use it we're spending half a million dollars on a house that you're not going to live in well we got a new judge who's going to use it that's why they're spending half a million dollars on it and once we have it built every judge has his courtroom Further, the county has invested $23 million 
and capital improvements at the courthouse between 2000 and 2015. $23 million, and, you know, we're still in the process of building that extra courtroom. Um, the county has spent $100,000 studying various real estate pre-design things, as I indicated, uh, and one of the reports apparently doesn't exist. Uh, we've got the Chin report. I think I talked to Ms. Chin with Commissioner Boyle for five or ten minutes, and I'm listed as one of the people that they consulted. I talked to the major stakeholders in this thing, and they talked to her a little bit more, but Miss Chin is not a person who lives or works here or has ever dispensed juvenile justice in Douglas County as far as I'm aware. Um, but she's an expert because she doesn't live here, and we paid her a lot of money to come here and tell us how to run our government. The makeup of the advisory <coughs> group for the study did not include anyone from the youth center, the public, or public property. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's anybody from public property here today. Public property is supposed to be here uh, when we talk about public property, but I, I understand they probably have other ob obligations. There's been no real discussion on the expenditure of $3.65 million plus $100 million. Um, and that means that we're kind of acting like a private corporation with public money. What we might want to do is slow down, take a deep breath, listen to what Mr. Bloomingdale said. His report is a good first step. Read the Chin report, try to find out where the other report went to, and read that. Have an in-depth discussion of where you come up with a hundred plus million dollars and why, and maybe look at all of the other properties around that could take some part or all of this project. This doesn't all have to be in one locale. In order to do that, and this, uh, to quote Commissioner Duda, may make too much sense to actually happen, I'm moving to lay this matter over for a week for more public notice and discussion. And I make that motion. Is there a second? Motion to ask for lack of second. There's a motion by Commissioner Borgeson, a second by Commissioner Boyle. Any discussion? Commissioner Craig. Uh, I, I, I would love to refute Commissioner Boyle's comment that there's no Commissioner Craft, you might want to talk in a little more. It's not picking up. Census, I'm, I'm as close as I can. I don't know if it's on. It's on. Yes, the mic should be on. Okay. Yeah, it does. So I can hear it tapping. Oh. Okay. Because it's time sensitive, I, and you have to strike when the properties are available. Um, now, the, well, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of the details of refuting what you said. Because, as I said, we'd be here too long. Thank you. Any other discussion on the item? Seeing none, there's a motion to second. Uh, Mr. Chair, sorry, I, point of clarification. Have, Commissioner Borgeson, that include both B and yeah. C? Okay. I, I do have. But but these aren't working, is that right? They are, but you want a point you want to make? Yeah, I have. Uh, Commissioner I, Kavanaugh. Yeah, I have a question. So, in the documents, it indicates simply by a check mark that um, this item is in the current year's budget. So um, I guess I'd ask our budget director, our finance director, where is it in our budget? This is not in, in the budget. It, the source of payment has been identified as a. Uh, uh, and X, you know, we budget every year for revenues for the inheritance tax uh, receipts. And this year's inheritance tax receipts uh, through close to 10 months now are tracking uh, over between four and a half and five million dollar favorable variance. 
And so that favorable variance has been identified as the source of funding for the purchase of these properties. And normally, if we weren't buying real estate with inheritance tax revenues, where would that revenue go? That inherit that would be up to the discretion of the county board. So we would basically be running with a four and a half to five million dollar in addition to our reserves uh, surplus, right? Yeah, this is an it's, addition to reserves, yes. Yeah, it's unencumbered. And so we're going to exhaust that basically on the purchase of this 3.65. Uh, and then based on the $100 million plus projection that we have in front of us, what strategic plan do we have for paying for that? We've been working with... Uh, uh, the building commission that would probably be uh, funded by uh, an issue of building commission bonds that we would put into a source of repayment over 25 to 30 years and we've been working over those projections with the appropriate legal and financial counsel. Okay. Um, does the building commission possess a hundred million dollar bonding authority? Yes. They currently have a hundred million dollar bonding authority? Yes. And so by a vote of the Building Commission, you're saying we're going to float $100 million worth of... It would be a Building Commission bond. Correct. But what I'm saying is the plan for this $100 million expenditure, you're saying, is to float a $100 million Building Commission bond issue. Yes. Uh, Commissioner... Duda, you've been on the Building Commission a long time. Is that going to happen? The Building Commission, uh, if we function more, if we look more at how Lancaster County, uh, Lincoln and Lancaster do their Building Commission, uh, what this would require is a vote of both the County Board and the City Council before the Building Commission would have the authority to do so. Uh, and the, the, if there is an agreement that the county is willing to pay the interest as well as the principal with this, that's the only way that we can take it on. The Building Commission does not have financial wherewithal on their own to do it without, but every bond that we ever issue has to have, it's a considered an amendment, uh, it has to have the blessings of both the county board and the city council before we can do anything. Okay, and I understand this because the Building Commission has its own mill levy, correct? Correct. Okay. So under the Building Commission's mill levy, which is based on property taxes, um, could they raise their mill levy to service a hundred million dollars worth of bonds? Only if the paying parties agreed to pay principal and interest. No, the Building Commission does not have deep enough pockets to go spend a hundred million dollars. We have a 1.5 cent tax rate, uh, and we're limited statutorily to a 1.7 cent tax rate. So, no, we don't have deep pockets. All we can do is represent the city and the county, and if they, if we have the full faith of the city and the county behind what we do, uh, then we can act jointly. So, if they were to exhaust their existing bond levy for, for a bond issue, how many dollars would that be? How much could they do? Uh, more in the ballpark of about $40 million, uh, but it depends if we leave the tax rate at $1.5. Cents. Uh, if we were to increase it to $1.7, cents, and we're only talking two-tenths of a cent difference here, that's what it would take to get to, I believe, about $40 million worth of bonding authority on our own. Okay, so the balance then would fall essentially to the county? It's all falling to the county. So a hundred million dollar liability to the county? Yes. Okay. And would the county then seek a hundred million dollar bond? I'm, I'm trying to f find the finances of this. It would be funded by a long-term lease ag agreement over the uh, length of the bond, which would be 25 or 30 years. So we would enter into a lease agreement with the building commission, uh, which would cover the bond payment. I understand, but as we just heard, the Building Commission does not have statutory authority to underwrite a $100 million bond issue. So Without the full faith of the county behind it. We okay. do if the county's behind it. Okay. 
And if the county is behind it, that would require a mill levy on the part of the county. Is that correct? Uh, uh, tax rate, yes. So that would be a property tax increase to the county to do this hundred million dollar bond issue. Yes. Thank you. I, be I believe so. And incidentally, I am in no way committed to building a hundred million dollar building. What I am committing to is buying property. Period. And then we'll wait and see what we decide to do with that property. And I appreciate that. And uh, you know, I I am not either. Uh, I'm not even at this point committed to to buying the property. I'm committed to discussing the purchase of the property. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I don't know that this is the only use that it could be put to. I see property all around uh, the city county center uh, that could be put to similar uses to this at perhaps less cost to the taxpayer. And all I'm saying is if we laid this over, we could take some time and maybe have that public discussion, maybe have some people up here who have skin in the game relative to property tax increases who would ask some questions about this. That's what I'm asking. And what I'm hearing is today's it. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we don't have the ability to have at least a one-week discussion about a $100 million property tax increase commitment in Douglas County. Commissioner Moore. Well, Jim, what I want to say is, is this on? I can't never tell. Okay. Um, the reason this was handled the way it was is because of the open meetings law. Uh, we we are allowed to go into executive session for three reasons personnel uh, real estate and litigation and um, This was the case and um, When you're dealing uh, in these matters uh, It's in the public interest to keep these uh, dealings extremely confidential because a disclosure or a leak could lead to the seller of property that's we're looking at uh, to be accelerated because we are a deep pocket. That's how we're seeing. So that's why this is was done the way it was. And I'm going to say something that's probably going to offend a bunch of people on the building commission, but I have been trying for, since 1999 to get on the building commission. And I suggested a number of times that we do things to alleviate the constant remodeling and butchering of that courthouse to the east of us. One of the things I suggested was when the parking garage was coming up that we not build it there, that we build it at uh, another site next west, which Jensen Tire would be excited to hear. Uh, actually not. And uh, there was a donation pending, a sizable one, that would have contributed to the construction of the garage if it could have been hooked up with the Rose Theater. Uh, I brought it up and it was rejected. So now we've landlocked ourselves with that garage, which I, don't, didn't approve, I did not want to see built there. I also suggested uh, when the Key Lime building was for sale that we move over there and I suggested a walkway into the clerk of the district court's office. That was next. You can't do it because the building's historical. There's nothing to do with it. The front of the building is, is historical. Just look at the west side. You can see how it can be butchered up too. So we have uh, the county attorney's uh, office that has four offices, one of which which is regularly flooded. Let me repeat it. It is his building, his offices are regularly flooded. They're under water. I watched over this period of time as the courthouse next door uh, was butchered and remodeling. I, I don't know what the cost has been. I should have probably checked it out. But I would venture a guess that the building commission, I would think, has spent close to $200 million remodeling that building over the period of time since uh, the last 45 years. I think it's been remodeled so many times, and it's under another major remodeling now, uh, that money is being spent there uh, constantly, constantly spent there. And we have no place to go. We have a very active and aggressive courtroom now for adults right around the corner from the juveniles, which I, it was put there before I got on the board, which I absolutely disapprove of. It's there. There's a jail up there too now, right down the hall from where the kids are. There's no more room. It is not, I don't think it's safe up there to have the, that facility there. If you go into the clerk of the district court's office up there, you have to walk sideways to get past the finals, the, the files. And not just because of my girth, but you have to walk sideways. 
So, I mean, th this is long overdue, long overdue. And I really wish the MUD site had worked because it made a lot of sense to walk right into the courthouse. This one is a very good site alternative. But we, you asked before, keep looking at sites. And I know you looked at the one to look at the uh, farm credit building or whatever that's called across the street, the AIM building. And, you know, I mean, it, first of all, it's not adjacent. It's close, but it's not. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the thing is that this has to be done in confidence. And as a member, uh, I offered, I said, why don't I get off this as a building commission member and let Jim Cavanaugh come in so you can be informed. But we cannot get these things out. You're asking for all this public input. You can't do that when you're trying to buy buildings. It is not in the public interest to do that. And I don't know of a case where we have ever done that, or any government has ever done that. It's irresponsible. It can't be done. So, uh, you know, we have a, a need. Tom Riley tells me that he walks out into the hallway, out of that place that was supposed to be a restaurant. Uh, it was the election office at one time. When you walk out of there, he says he comes out to get sunlight. To get, it's that bad. I know they got some skylights, but it's not, not enough. The ceiling's low. It's a very bad situation. Uh, so this is this is a very good solution, um, and we need to quit spending money um, as rapidly as we can on tearing apart that building. So, uh, if there are no other speakers, I would call for the question. Seeing no other speakers, there's a motion and a second to approve items uh, B and C. Please vote. Mm -hmm. Yes. passes. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh voting no. Commissioner Morgan abstaining. All other commissioners voting yes. Let me state uh, my reason for abstaining. Uh, some time ago when one of my people was working with the Housing Authority on looking at locations, uh, I contacted uh, by phone the Accountability and Disclosure uh, Commission. Mr. Daly is who I visited with and uh, told him even if I did not have a conflict, I planned to abstain uh, from that. My company or myself will not receive any compensation on this. My person is doing it at about uh, a third of the normal fee, and uh, I have been advised I went down and met with the accountability and disclosure now uh, last week to be certain. I do not have a conflict, but I, as I told Mr. Daly uh, more than probably a month ago, I still plan to abstain. So I want to address that publicly, and I don't plan to uh, vote on this matter as it continues along. I'll answer questions if anyone asks me questions about whatever, but that's my uh, situation, and I wanted to state it clearly, and we're required to state things if we abstain, so that's why I wanted to make it very clear. Chair. Commissioner Moore. I just want to comment. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Duda asked me if I wasn't voting on this. My uh, voting um, machine over here is gone, so I have to tell the clerk how I vote so he records it. Uh, I've been concerned about that because it looks like I'm uh, a ghost, uh, which I'm not. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I voted yes to make it clear. And if I may add a personal note, uh, I have been involved in these meetings um, uh, for quite some time now. And I want to say that uh, Commissioner Morgan's um, uh, contribution to the, the discussion has been invaluable. His, uh, his uh, knowledge in real estate matters and um, uh, the comments that he makes are generally helpful, always helpful. Uh, to the discussion, and I want to state that we're very fortunate to have have him on the county board, uh, but also uh, involved in this uh, transaction. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your nice comments. Sure. Thank you. I know you're a Republican, but I still say that. <laughs> <laughs> I may switch soon for you. <laughs> no. Okay, we literally have one minute before we kind of need to change, so if we have item G, which is human resources. Item one is the weekly personnel report, and I'm assuming that's as submitted. Okay. Um, item two, there's no legislative items that I'm aware of. With that, we do have reason for executive session.
Mr. Chair, I would like to add, in light of the discussion and the information we've had from Mr. Herzog, I would like to add a request on legislative matters that we ask Marcos to uh, uh, read the uh, correspondence we had from Mr. Herzog and to put together uh, possibly some draft legislation that we could then propose as suggested by Commissioner Borders, and I'd like to see us do that. Can, can I ask you this, Commissioner Borders? Yes. Um, Director Foxhall, I've been asking them, they are supposed to be ready sometime next year to present on this issue? The pretrial matrix that I've asked them to put together. Okay. They've been meeting with the judges, they've okay. been lining things up, and if we can include it all in there, I'd, I'd That'd be I'd great. Do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with that, we have no legislative items. We do have need for an executive session for the purposes of litigation and real estate. With that, is there a motion to second to go in executive so session? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Morgan. Morgan, please vote. I vote yes. Commissioner Rogers and Kavanaugh. Motion <laughs> passes. Commissioner Kavanaugh is absent. Everyone else voting yes. And again, we're going to executive session for litigation and real estate. You all should put your stuff together. They're likely going to take it back. So put your, prepare your materials.